Hi. Um, we're expecting more people, but I think we'll just get started and let people trickle in so that we stay on time. Um, I'm Sally Ryder. I'm the director of the Rehnquist Center, and I wanted to welcome you to our annual Constitution Day program, and thank you for coming. Our schedule is we have four cases to discuss. We'll discuss two cases, then we'll take a break at 225, and then come back after 15 minutes, and we'll conclude at 415. After the program, there will be a little reception in the courtyard. Uh, I want especially to thank Marlene Cooksey and Jana Browneyes for putting this program together. It's so much work behind the scenes to pull something like this together, and th they really did a yeoman's job taking care of it. Uh, I'm going to introduce our very distinguished panel, but I'm intentionally going to give them short shrift, which I think is fitting because I've been told that the more accomplished a person is, the shorter their introduction should be. And I'm going to um, do it in order of the distance they travel to be with us. So I'm going to start with Linda Greenhouse, who's in the center. Linda Greenhouse is the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence and Joseph Goldstein Lecturer at Yale Law School. She covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times between 1978 and 2008, and she currently writes a bi-weekly bi column on the law. She's a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Scientists and is one of only two non-lawyer honorary members of the American Law Institute. She's won numerous awards over her career, including the Pulitzer Prize in 1998 for, quote, her consistently illuminating coverage of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you for coming. Linda. And to Linda Greenhouse's right is Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is a partner in Morgan Lewis's litigation practice and heads the firm's Supreme Court and appellate litigation. He's argued before the Supreme Court nine times and regularly appears on the best appellate lawyers lists. Prior to joining Morgan Lewis, Mr. Cruz was the Solicitor General of Texas for five years, and when he was appointed, he was the youngest Solicitor General in the United States. He's taught at the University of Texas School of Law and served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Rehnquist during the 1996 term. Thank you. <laughs> Judge Neil Wake took his seat on the U.S. District Court for the District of Arizona in March of 2004. Prior to being named to the bench, Judge Wake was in private practice in Phoenix, specializing in commercial, administrative, and constitutional litigation, as well as appellate practice and Indian law. Judge Wake is a great supporter of the law school and the Rehnquist Center. Um, I'm glad he was able to come to this year's program. Last year was a rare break when he didn't join us. And on a personal note, we grew up in the same no neighborhood, so we go way back. Tony Massaro on the end is the Regents Professor and Mel Milton O'Reepy Chair in Constitutional Law and the Dean Emerita of the Law School. Including her 10 years as Dean from 1999 to 2009, Professor Massaro has taught here at the Law School since 1989. She is the person who formed the idea for the Rehnquist Center, is one of its biggest supporters, and is also serves on our governing board. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> And finally, Professor David Marcus, who's been an associate professor of law here since 2006. He's also taught at Stanford Law School and was in private practice in San Francisco from 2003 to 2005. He clerked on the federal district court for Judge Aline, is that my pronouncing it? Alan Ross in the Eastern District of New York and for Judge William Fletcher on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And Professor Marcus graciously agrees every year to take the hardest job in this program and that is introducing each of the cases in a thorough, yet concise, and almost always hilarious way. So I know I put the pressure on every year. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Professor Marcus. As Sally uh, said, I've uh, participating in our Constitution Day exercises now for, I think, five years. And I think that this, is, this panel, while previous panels have been really stellar, this one is spectacular, notwithstanding the present person talking. 
So uh, I first think it's important for us to give a round of applause to Sally Ryder for uh, organizing all of this for us. I think it's, it merits a little bit more reflection on the credentials of, of uh, the panelists uh, before you. Um, I'm going to call him General Cruz, although he told me not to. Uh, General Cruz, because it sounds, I would love to be called General someday. Um, <laughs> General Cruz argued nine cases in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, he is presently running for the United States Senate from Texas, and my father, who says he claims to know everything about Texas politics, says that he's the, he's the next guy. So, uh, so that, that's, that's our next senator from Texas. Um, there's uh, knock on wood, don't want to jinx it. We have Dean Massaro. Uh, Dean Massaro, it was such a spectacular success as Dean that half this school is named after her. Uh, <laughs> in no way did my hiring uh, detract from her overall record of success, which is particularly impressive. Um, Linda Greenhouse has an entire effect named after her. Uh, I don't think that needs anything else. And then Judge Wake, um, when, when, when three L's at the beginning of their third year come to talk to me and ask me what, to whom they should apply for clerkships, I say, well, I hope you've included Judge Wake. As far as I'm concerned, the best judge in Arizona and probably uh, for uh, quite a long ways beyond our borders. Uh, I don't quite know why I'm up here, um, given uh, my comparative lack of expertise or uh, uh, accomplishment. Uh, I'm not a constitutional law professor. I'm a mere proceduralist, which is the most simple-minded of all the law professors. Uh, but I uh, will nonetheless take the stab at trying to summarize the uh, four sets of cases that we have for discussion today. So I'll begin. I'm, in, in years past, I've begun with a an attempt to put the past term of the Supreme Court in some kind of overview, some kind of historical overview. Um, I'm going to forego that today because we have so much to talk about and um, we have so many inter interesting people to hear from. So I'm just going to dive right in and talk about the Arizona Free Enterprise case first. In 1991, 10 percent of the Arizona State Legislature was indicted on corruption-related charges. One legislator was videotaped stuffing tens of thousands of dollars into a gym bag and saying into a hidden microphone, there's not an issue in the world I give a shit about, and I sold out way too cheaply. Actually, he said I sold out way too cheap. I, I put the adverb in there. Uh, <laughs> scandals like this one led Arizona voters in 1998 to adopt by initiative the Arizona Citizens Clean Elections Act. The idea was to cut the links between elected officials and campaign donors to reduce the potential that the latter would tempt the former into corruption. The Clean Elections Act created a system of publicly financed uh, campaigns. If you wanted to, if you're a candidate, you could opt into public financing and receive campaign funds from the state. One big problem with public financing, the public funding of campaigns, is that it's easy for privately financed uh, 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 candidates to spend more than their publicly financed uh, adversaries. Public financing often comes with a cap on the total amount that the state is willing to uh, pay for. The Clean Elections Act came up with a response. If the total of what your opponent and independent groups working on her behalf exceeds your initial allotment of public funds, you get dollar for dollar matching funds up to a limit of three times the initial allotment. So let me give you an example. Dean Massaro and I are running, for, uh, are running against each other for the Arizona State House. As a lowly, marginally talented law professor, I am very poor and also socially inept. I don't have any money of my own to spend on my campaign, and nor am I particularly good at raising it from others. So I opt for public financing and receive an initial allotment of a little over $20,000. Now, Dean Massaro is quite wealthy. She used her time as dean to set up a system whereby any time anyone uses the letter A, either orally or writing in the state, she gets $10. So she has thus unlimited wealth that she can spend and, her, and run a smear campaign against my idealistic vision for a better Arizona. Moreover, she has formed an, or an independent group titled the Tony's Tigers Super PAC, whose membership is limited to oil company executives and former third world dictators, uh, has tons of money to spend as well. So for every dollar that Dean Massaro and the tigerish pack she benefits from spend in excess of $20,000, I get a matching dollar up to about $60,000. Now here's the question in Arizona Free Enterprise versus Bennett. Does the funding mechanism in the clean elections law, triggered when a privately financed candidate spends more than the initial allotment of public funding, violate the First Amendment? The free speech guarantee in the First Amendment obviously uh, protects political speech, which includes the right to spend money in a political campaign. In 1976, the Supreme Court decided Buckley versus Vallejo, its seminal uh, elections, uh, uh, election law case, and in the case, it made several important decisions. 
Uh, the court concluded that restrictions on political speech are subject to sc strict scrutiny, which requires that restrictions have a compelling state interest and are narrowly tailored to serve that interest. The court also concluded that preventing corruption or the appearance of corruption justified limits on campaign finance contributions that otherwise might infringe on First Amendment rights. Um, Preventing a political quid pro quo is, uh, is sufficiently compelling to justify restrictions on contributions. But the court rejected a leveling the playing field rationale to uh, uh, permit restrictions on campaign expenditures. In several cases after Buckley, the court expanded on what it meant by this anti-corruption interest, most notably in a case called Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce. The court went beyond a simple quid pro quo conception of corruption. It up upheld limits on what corporations could spend based on a compelling interest in preventing what the courts described as a different type of corruption, the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth. Recently, however, the court has retreated back to a very narrow view of what sort of anti-corruption interest justifies restrictions on campa campaign expenditures as political speech. Most uh, famously or infamously, it did so in the Citizens United decision of last term, a case that we dis discussed last year. But more important for our purposes is a 2008 case called F Davis versus FEC. The Davis case involved something called a millionaire's amendment to the uh, um, uh, omnibus campaign finance law uh, passed in the early part of the 21st century, the federal law. The millionaire's amendment provided that if a self-funded candidate's expenditures exceeded non-self-funded candidates by more than $350,000, the non-self-funded candidate could solicit three times more funds from a donor than a self-funded candidate could. Um, that's a lot of words, but I hope, I hope you get the idea. The Supreme Court declared the Millionaire's Amendment unconstitutional. The right to spend money on a campaign is strongly protected by the First Amendment. The Millionaire's Amendment, in, in essence, penalized the exercise of this right. If the millionaire spent money on his campaign, he would increase his opponent's ability to uh, fundraise. There's no compelling government interest in this penalty on spending campaign expenditures. The millionaire was spending his own money and thus less susceptible to corruption. And there's no compelling interest in leveling the playing field among candidates. Im implicit, implicit in Davis is a rejection of Austin's take on anti-corruption. It's okay for massively wealthy people vastly to outspend their adversaries and distort the process in the manner that the Austin court feared. Now this brings us up to Arizona Free Enterprise. How you think about the Clean Elections Act with its triggering mechanism, depends on which way your brain bends. Arizona argued that the triggering mechanism actually produced more speech and thus was consistent with the First Amendment. If a privately financed candidate for the Arizona House spent $25,000, then the publicly financed candidate could spend $25,000 too. There's more speech, more ideas broadcast. The First Amendment shines through gloriously. The opponents argued that the triggering mechanism produced less speech. A privately financed candidate would be less willing to spend his own money. Why would he do so when the triggering mechanism would mean that his expenditure of money would subsidize his opponent? The Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision agreed with the law's opponents. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority, concluded that the issue was essentially settled in Davis. The Clean Elections Act penalized privately funded candidates from spending their own money and thus speaking politically. This penalty substantially burdened First Amendment rights and there's no compelling state interest served by the triggering mechanism. This law, the court, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts concluded, was really about leveling the playing field, despite Arizona's claim and despite the history of the statute, that it was really about getting uh, corruption out of politics. Justice Kagan, writing for herself and the three uh, leftist center justices, dissented. She insisted that the law creates more speech, uh, not less, because it enables different candidates to spend more. Also, she accepted that the law did, in fact, serve an anti-corruption interest. This is the decision in a nutshell, so let me suggest a couple of ways to think about it. As to the significance of the decision itself, a lot of liberals were up in arms after the court uh, rendered its decision. Here goes the Supreme Court ruling for millionaires again. Now, I'm not so sure that, in its, that it'll have the kind of immediate impact that many, uh, uh, many of, of these critics of the court fear. Uh, now, I said the same thing about Citizens United last year, and I proved, was proven spectacularly wrong to the tune of about $400 million spent on the 2010 congressional campaign that wasn't spent in 2006. So I, I, I have no standing to make any prognostications, but I will, I will nonetheless do so. Um, 
Uh, I'm not so sure that this that this this decision will have any direct all that much direct effect. The clean elections law there's there's a fair amount of data on it, and it didn't seem to achieve some of the purposes that uh, it's it, that w were aspired for it. Um, it didn't seem to diminish the amount of money spent by independent ex uh, groups in Arizona elections and so forth. Moreover, only about half a dozen states or so have similar laws that are now have been invalidated by the Arizona Free Enterprise decision. One might say, well, that, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at the case is that this is, uh, that, that the Supreme Court uh, made a major decision in Citizens United and now is, is whittling away at the, all the other ways in which states have tried to cabin the influence of large aggregations of wealth. And so this is just another, this is another in a series of decisions that in the end will fundamentally alter the landscape of campaign finance. But what I, what I think is significant about this decision is what it says to me about Chief Justice Roberts as a judicial statesman. Campaign finance laws have now gone 0 for 5 in the Roberts court. Citizens United decided in 2010, of course, caused all sorts of controversy, and the court weathered a significant amount of criticism as a result. Coupled with the Roberts court's record on campaign finance laws, Citizens United suggested to some that the court is comfortable with the corporate domination of American politics. One might think that in order to safeguard its institutional legitimacy, the court would have considered staying out of campaign finance for a few years, let its reputation recover. There's no reason why it had to grant cert in this case. And certainly there wasn't any reason why it had to preliminarily enjoin the clean elections uh, law in the summer of 2010, well before it heard the case on the merits. One might think that in order to safeguard its institutional legitimacy, the court would have just backed away. This decision, even if not that significant on the ground here in Arizona, gives wholly avoidable am ammunition to the court's critics, who are eager to portray the conservative majority as in the pocket of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as a majority that will happily sacrifice institutional legitimacy for progress toward its ideological goals. The tone of the decisions uh, 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 lends this, to this critique as well. I said last year that I thought Chief Justice Roberts was one of the great uh, writers on the court and in the court's recent history. I'm going to take that back now. Uh, he's not a great writer. He's just snarky. Um, let me read some of his snarky sentences. Here's one. But in a democracy, campaigning for office is not a game. That's true, but it's not helpful. It doesn't make me any more convinced by your argument. Nor does Roberts annoyingly frequent sentences that lack verbs. To the students out there, the following are not good sentences. Again, a markedly more significant burden than in Davis. True when we said it, and true today. Even more distressing to me is that Justice Kagan got down in the muck with Chief Justice Roberts and often substituted rhetoric for reason. Me too is not a sentence as far as I'm concerned, but it is for Justice Kagan. Only one thing is missing from the court's response. Any reasoning to support its conclusion, Kagan says, doing her best, best Justice Scalia impression. We're headed for a remarkable showdown in American constitutional law next year, I think, and we'll discuss the health care cases uh, uh, later and why that this, is, this is likely to be the case. I would hope that the court would rehearse its civility and concern for institutional legitimacy now rather than practice its name calling and wear its ideological commitment so avowedly on its sleeve. I will now turn the floor over to Judge Wake. Well, thank you, Professor. Uh I was pleased to uh, take the lead on this case because one of, in, in my former life, one of my many sidelights is I did election litigation. It was a sidelight, and um, it, it's seasonal work. You do it every two years, and um, it ranged all over the map. So this was of interest uh, to me. This was passed, this uh, clean elections was passed by uh, an initiative in 1998, and I remember it's first dramatic effect in the elections of 2002, where Governor Napolitano, who I've been friends with, I think, since the year she came to town, um, won the election by one-tenth of one percent uh, for governor, and she ran on clean elections, and Matt Salmon ran private funding. And then Janet, uh, Governor Napolitano was also helped by the fact that her good friend, Jim Peterson, a, a wealthy, uh, politically active person, contribute over $2 million to the Arizona Democratic Party that was used to support a campaign. So um, that's how it played out that time. I don't really recall whether she got matching funds. I don't know if she did. But, uh, it shows the imprecision of these attempts to uh, tinker with the process. <coughs> I, um, uh, w well, th the way this has worked out, uh, the, the, both opinions talk about how it's actually a, worked out in terms of affecting behavior of candidates in Arizona. Uh, 
and uh, as I think one would expect, um, be behavior is not uh, uniform. Um, there is plenty of evidence to think that people were intentionally not raising money or spending money to avoid triggering the matching entitlement for opposing candidates who were on the, 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 match, uh, the public funding system. <clears throat> At the same time, there's some indication in the dissenting opinion that other people did, were not so limited and went ahead and, and spent money even though it did trigger matching. That would not surprise me because the reality is sometimes uh, people who, for whom raising money is less of a burden uh, will decide to do that if they think their message is better. And I do remember one uh, campaign uh, back in the 90s, a very big uh, primary campaign where a friend of mine uh, who was not the leading candidate um, was tracking the uh, advertisements of the leading candidate and the more he was on TV and the radio, the lower his approval went. Now that's a candidate that you want to get matching funds. So, and uh, my friend won that election. So, so behavior will vary, but um, uh, I don't think there is really a, no doubt that the intent of that statute was to equalize funding by driving out private funding by making it uh, futile. Um, I'll tell you there, there's a lot of comment in our community, in our state, about uh, our political process and the legislature, and some people say that our legislature does not reflect uh, the breadth and diversity of our community, that they tend to be uh, people from one end or the other of the two major political parties and not representative of the breadth. I think 31% of registered voters in Arizona are independent. Um, and some people, um, I've seen comments that some people think that one of the several reasons for that is the clean elections. And that is, it's very easy to get on the ballot for the legislature now and, and, and to get that funding. You raise a certain number of $5 contributions. And so people can go out and raise those contributions and get this modest amount of funding and be there. And as we all know who live here, it's common to see legislative candidates who frankly are fresh new people. You don't know them, you don't know about them. The campaigning is done almost entirely by mail, um, telephone robocalls, um, community and public appearances, uh, and walking the streets. There's really no elect uh, media over the air media advertising that I've ever known or heard of for legislative candidates. There is of course for statewide candidates. So for that modest amount of money, people can get there who have no community support. So people get on the ballot who lack community support and may get elected who haven't had the breadth of community involvement to make them known and support it. I'm not saying I agree with that. I, I don't know if that's true, but that is being talked about as one of the possible explanations for what some people describe of the, as the lack of match between the whole cultural and political demographics of the state and the configuration of our uh, legislature. Now, after about 2002, when I was still in law practice, I thirsted for a paying client to challenge this statute. I really wanted to take this one on. Um, not because I knew what the, for sure what the answer was, but I thought there, I thought there was gonna be a ticket to the Supreme Court with this one. And, um, it is some consolation to me that when this finally did get to the Supreme Court, nobody had a paying client. All the lawyers were working for free. So, or it sure looks that way. So, um, now, I, I have some thoughts here about the process and about the substance. Uh, as, the, as Professor Marcus said, the, the court articulated the two, two uh, offered justifications for this statute. It was one to, quote, level the playing field, equalize funding, but, um, I submit that there can be no fair uh, debate that the purpose of this law was to uh, equalize the funding by rendering private fund making futile most of the time. It wasn't despite the um, uh, flights of rhetoric in Justice Kagan's dissent. It wasn't to add more speech to the other speech. It was to constrict the speech and to essentially make it pointless to do anything but the uh, state-financed uh, system.
The other uh, articulated purpose was to eliminate, uh, uh, well, to combat corruption, but it wasn't by targeting corruption in any way. It was really more combating corruption by eliminating or greatly reducing private fundraising altogether. Now, when I say that, that may sound pejorative, and I don't mean it to be that way, because that's something worth uh, discussing. But those are the, <coughs> the two things that are put forward. And, you know, but bo bo both, of, both of the opinions, the court's opinion and the, and the dissenting opinion, uh, uh, analyze this on the means used by uh, the initiative to achieve objectives. And I would throw out for thought that it might be more helpful to think of these two purposes directly and honestly and think about the constitutionality of, the, constitutionality of those purposes themselves. Now, as Professor Marcus says, the courts, uh, the majority opinion was pretty straightforward that this is a substantial burden on private speech following the Davis case, the, the Millionaire's Amendment, and if it was an, in, uh, it was an un unacceptable burden on free speech, to let the other guy raise more money, a fortiori, it's an unacceptable burden on free speech to give the other guy more money uh, if he is uh, raising money. Um, the, um, the perspective the court took, as in the Davis case, was from that of the candidate. Um, the dissenting opinion offers, well, the dissenting opinion offers a lot of things, but um, it offers a little more of a perspective on the systemic effects of the uh, campaign process, the election process. Um, and I would note, I, you didn't note this, but one of the arguments was, well, you know, the state could just lump this three times money, 60 some thousand, they just could give them a lump all at one time. And there's no dispute about that. And all this does is uh, modulating how it comes out. I would submit the majority is right in saying that th that overlooks the, the, the defect in the way it's done. It's not given out all at once. It's only given out if someone else raises the money uh, uh, privately. And if, in fact, they gave out all the money up front, uh, probably a whole lot more people would take the money. Um, if So uh, that struck me as an uh, unpers unpersuasive counter. The court says that leveling the playing field is not a uh, compelling state interest. Well, um, that may be true in general, but it may be overbroad. Um, one could level the playing field in other ways. If you just did public funding or you gave money to everyone or other things to increase uh, the access of everyone, I doubt the court would think that that is automatically um, an invalid or not a compelling state interest. The, the real issue is the way that was used here, whether leveling the playing field by neutralizing private fundraising slash uh, speech um, uh, with public money is a legitimate uh, ground. And um, the, um, the other, uh, the anti-corruption justification, again, um, there's no suggestion here that this system is going to target any corruption. It's really aimed on a gross level of reducing the significance of privately raised money uh, by, in effect, forcing people to participate in the uh, public uh, system. Now, as the court notes, um, the, the contribution limits in Arizona are extremely low. They're among the lowest in the country. Um, so, it's, and, and, you know, I don't know if, I, I rather doubt that bundling is a significant issue for our legislative candidate, candidates as it is in many federal elections, but it, it, uh, one would have to conclude that the risk of, of corruption from these low con contribution limits is, is rather low. I have uh, a, a friend who's very involved in Republican um, party matters and fundraising and, and it told me once that he was in another state with a gathering of other similarly interested people, party officials, and they were talking about the campaign fund limits and someone from Florida said, "With you can only contribute $410 to a legislative candidate? He says, that's great. They didn't want to be hit up for the uh, contributions. So it's, 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 uh, it, it is a very severe limitation uh, there. Um, the, um, in effect, the, 
I would suggest this argument about combating corruption by greatly reducing private fundraising is rather like saying that you want to keep water weeds out of your pond by draining the pond. Um, it's, it's far too severe a remedy to the problem that you articulate as, as justifying it. Um, the, um, now, uh, let me conclude with this thought. The, um, if you step out of our constitutional doctrine and case law and the things that lawyers uh, wring their hands about, and you look at the, the, the global way we do politics here, it is quite amazing. If you look at other countries like in Great Britain, um, they have a totally different election system. It, their campaigns run about you know, six weeks. Um, there isn't near as much money. But they have a different system. Their government is largely party government, where candidates are selected by the party. Over here, anybody can run for the party nomination. And they do, we don't have party nominated uh, or party funded candidates in primaries. Once they win general elections, sometimes they get party money. But uh, over there, they do it, and they, they have it over with, and they don't have this perpetual process of fundraising and, and, and money spending. And one would have to look back and look and see, well, what's wrong with that as a system of democratic self-governance? And could something be done like that? I acknowledge the legitimacy of those, uh, those questions. And to that extent, Justice Kagan's um, somewhat extensive co collection of lots of attenuated arguments, <coughs> none of which are very persuasive, to weigh toward a different result is understandable. Um, but I suggest this was uh, not the way that one could get to it. Thank you. So I'll open the discussion to other, and I'll, we can just go down in order or. Um, okay. you know, just, just briefly, I think. Uh, you know, contextually, of course, this referendum was adopted out of, out of desperation uh, with the failure of, because of Buckley against Vallejo and because of the equation of money and speech, you can't stop people from spending their own money. You can disincentivize them, but you can't stop them. So, you know, when you mentioned that if you just had public funding, you know, that would be fine. But, of course, you couldn't really bind anybody under the First Amendment to limiting themselves to the public funds. So, so the court's First Amendment, Amendment doctrines in this area, uh, for better or worse, have kind of ended up so all up in a, in a cul-de-sac from which there seems to be no way out, no way of uh, doing anything about the flow of money in politics. I certainly don't have a solution. If I did, I would go out there in the countryside and, 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 and market it. But um, just speaking as a citizen, I mean, whereas I used to be you know, pretty content with the Buckley regime and the distinction between contributions and expenditures. Uh, just the last couple of years uh, with, you know, you, the court up, upholds the, the heart of McCain-Feingold with, uh, with the soft money, and so what do you get? You get these 527 organizations coming up that are completely non-transparent, and nobody knows, you know, who's funding the swift boat thing. And, and all that, um, the court has just gotten us into a bit of a mess. And so I think, I think this case really exemplifies something about the First Amendment that I, as a lifelong journalist, never thought I'd be saying. But I am concerned that the First, that the First Amendment in the hands of the Supreme Court is just running off the rails. Uh, it's become a tool of uh, deregulation, whether in uh, efforts to control money in politics, or in the case that came down in June, the uh, Sorrell against IMS Health, where uh, an extremely uh, robust version of commercial speech was invoked by the majority to uh, protect the practice of data mining, of, of uh, selling of doctor prescription information to pharmaceutical companies who want to use it to target doctors to sell their their high-priced drugs, uh, that this is some kind of First Amendment protected speech. I, you know, I think for any originalist, uh, 
and the originalist would be left, you know, scratching his head uh, about the core meaning of the First Amendment. So, um, you know, not, not to not to refute any of your excellent points, but I think to take a, a step back and say, uh, you know, what kind of system are we living in where the First Amendment is is uh, curbing government's ability to um, basically have sensible policies that, in this case, the good people of Arizona uh, were desperately trying to get their hands on. I've got three observations on this case. Uh, the, the first one uh, has to do with, with legal principles. I understand a First Amendment absolutist. I understand someone like a Justice Hugo Black that says no law means no law. That, I think, is an intellectually consistent, coherent position. Um, I suppose I understand someone who says I don't really care a lot about the First Amendment and, and won't enforce it across the board. It's not right, but it's at least a coherent position. I have to admit I have real difficulty understanding the position of the dissenters in this case in that I don't consider myself clever enough to view how the First Amendment somehow, if the First Amendment, it seems to me, is about anything, it's about political speech. If you look at the history of the First Amendment, why it was adopted, coming out of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and a war, it started being about political speech. And I, I find myself not nearly clever enough to maintain that the First Amendment somehow skips over political speech but reaches out to embrace things like kiddie porn or like violent video games. The dissenters thought violent video games are protected in the heart of the First Amendment. But somehow people running for office, that you know, political speech, that's not what the First Amendment's about. That seems a very odd way of interpreting the First Amendment, that if it is about anything, it's about first and foremost political speech. A second observation, a, a, a frequent response, indeed Justice Stevens in Citizens United in his dissent said money is not speech, and there are many people, many lawyers who, who adamantly believe that. Um, I think that position is demonstrably false. If money is not speech, then there should be no problem. Let's, let's take a for-profit corporation that routinely spends millions of dollars on political speech. The New York Times. It's a public corporation. It spends millions printing newspapers, hiring reporters, flying them around the world, and it speaks very loudly on political matters. Now, if it's true that money's not speech, there should be no problem with Congress passing a law that says no newspaper, television station, or any media outlet may spend more than $1,000 discussing any matter of politics. 60 days before an election. Now, to me, that law is blatantly unconstitutional. I, I don't have any difficulty getting to that conclusion. But if one begins with the proposition money isn't speech, then one somehow has to draw a distinction. Well, why is it that the New York Times has a special First Amendment protection? Because there's a press clause in the First Amendment. Uh, and so without the... Pro okay, fine, fine. So without the press clause, let, let me say a different thing. If there were no freedom of press, a law restricting the New York Times from spending money would violate the freedom of speech. It strikes me, I, I see no reason why some outlets should be favored over another. And a, a third point I'll make is, is, is a much more practical point. Uh, as someone who has run for office and is running for office right now, I think campaign finance restrictions are among the most misunderstood restrictions in public policy because they are always sold to the public as this is a way to protect from corruption. I'm going to suggest to you as a practical matter that campaign finance restrictions almost always serve one principal function, and that is to protect incumbents and to make it difficult to defeat incumbents in elections. And, and we shouldn't be surprised about this. They are passed by incumbent politicians who get together and agree that the most horrible thing in the world that could possibly happen 
is they're being voted out of office. Now, I'll tell you how it operates in a state like the state of Texas, which is a large state and it's an expensive state. The federal campaign finance limits, as a practical matter, means there are only two types of human beings that can run statewide in a large state with expensive media markets. Incumbent politicians with vast fundraising apparatuses that have been built up over years, or multimillionaires. And to be honest, the only reason the multimillionaires are there is because the Supreme Court won't let the incumbent politicians get rid of it. They would love to get rid of the multimillionaires. Because if they could get rid of the multimillionaires, then nobody could challenge an incumbent politician. And I say this not in the abstract. My principal opponent in this race is worth several hundred million dollars. He's going to write a 10 to 20 million dollar check from his own pocket. People don't understand often the practical effect of these limits are that they protect the incumbents. And I'll give you just an interesting anecdote. I've had the experience of running both in a state race and a federal race. Two years ago, I ran for attorney general in the state of Texas until the race didn't materialize at the end of the day. But in Texas, there are no campaign finance limits. Individuals can contribute any amount, and there's full disclosure. Because of that system, uh, you know, we talked about sort of the poor law professor. When I was running for attorney general, I had been working as Solicitor General as a government employee. I didn't have personal money. I didn't have an incumbent statewide apparatus, and I was running against four strong elected officials. The only way I was able to do that is we didn't have limits. So I was able to go and get some significant donors to write me big checks. Now, that all became public, and I made the case. Here's what I stand for. If you agree with it, I need your help. If we had had limits in the state race, I could never have d done that. In the AG race, what ended up happening is we built so much support, every other candidate dropped out. But it was only because of the lack of limits that a challenger without a political apparatus could build that support. If, there if the limits were there, it would have been impossible. In a federal race, as a practical matter, that's the way it operates. And now, the intersection of the federal limits and Citizens United is utterly bizarre because you raise money under the limits, but independent groups spend millions. So in, in my race for Senate, there will almost surely be independent expenditures, both supporting me and opposing me. And as a matter of federal law, I have no idea what those will be. I feel sometimes like Scarlett O'Hara. I, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. There is something utterly bizarre about the fact that I don't know if people are going to spend money or not, but they might, in which case they'll put millions of dollars of television ads on the screen, and I don't know what they are. I will find out about them. They may be supporting me. I hope they bear some resemblance to policies I agree with. But the current finance rule is they can spend it. Mike could spend $5 million, but I can't know what it is. And I can watch it the same time everyone else does. Now, that's just a stupid way to do campaigns, to have third parties driving the messages. And the reason is it would make a lot more sense if someone wanted to play a role for them to contribute the money to the candidate, to have that be public, so everyone could say, you talked about $2 million that was given in the Arizona race. Everyone could say, hey, who is this person? Why is this money being given? Let, their, let speech disinfect it, but it would make a lot more sense to let the candidates talk about their own messages. But under our current system, we've got a bizarre game where you get third parties talking and we're stifling political speech, and it's designed by incumbents to protect themselves. And, and personally, I don't think it makes any sense at all. Well, I think someone has to speak up for the oil companies, don't you? And, and the former third world. And the former third world. Well, Sometimes one and the same. You think the dictator's a bad thing, but not always. All right. Uh, first of all, the incumbents didn't write this. The people of Arizona voted for it. So I think that there's a, you know, a factual distinction here that gets lost. And we'll be doing a number of cases in which we think about the court's opportunity to second guess um, states state sovereign. This was the people directly. Right or wrong, this is what we did. Right or wrong, we could correct it. Um, but not now. I mean, I think Linda's point is well taken, um, and but so is yours. He's saying the laws don't work, that the laws are stupid. 
I'm not surprised. There's tremendous incentive. It's like commercial speech in this way. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, where there's an opportunity to deceive, it's likely to happen. Um, and elections um, line up very well, I think, with some of the incentive structures that we see in the commercial speech arena. It's, so it's hardy in that regard. Um, but the notion that the court isn't contributing to this, I think, is also just wrong. Um, the doctrine is doing work here, and the recent <coughs> doctrine is doing the following work that I think you, that you ought to pay attention to. It, w when the court rejects the anti-distortion justification for campaign regulation as often and as thoroughly as it has, it puts a lot of pressure on the anti-corruption justification for, for looking at these measures. And the anti-corruption justification that this court seemed to embrace is getting narrower and narrower um, and zeroing in on more of a quid pro quo. That's what corruption looks like to the court. And, it, you know, the framers, um, there was an amicus brief that was filed in the case um, authored by Sammy Sakharov and Zephyr Teachout that made the following historical point. So what did the framers think about corruption? Did the framers think corruption should be construed narrowly quid pro quo? And I think they make an, at least a plausible case, though I think people searching for history explanations for things often are looking for what they want to find. Um, uh, but they'd make a plausible case that the framers were not naive. And the framers thought that there was something beyond quid pro quo corruption that might distort the process. And they drafted the First Amendment at the same time. So they thought these two ideas logically could go together even in the arena of admittedly core political speech. The brief looks at the foreign gifts clause of the Constitution. Ben Franklin took gifts. Uh, they didn't think that it was necessarily, uh, necessarily the case that Ben Franklin was corrupt but the appearance of corruption mattered. And uh, there are other examples that were given um, in the brief that I thought we were paying attention to, but I think there's a selective invocation of history, there's a selective invocation of framers, and this is a state level um, matter in any event, and there's almost no attention paid uh, to the framers of the due process clause, which is doing the work here. This is a, a due process incorporation of the First Amendment. So we ought to be looking at what was going on in 1868 in any event, and not just what's going on in 1791. Um, and we might look at the adoption of the 17th Amendment and uh, look at why um, there's a, a conclusion that the election, the direct election of senators was problematic because of the hopeless corruption that they had seen at that point when you allowed the legislatures to do it. Um, in other words, can't we get back to some semblance of uh, co American community that says, you know what, corruption, distortion, bad idea in election. Let's see if we can come up with a better way of running this and pay attention to when the Supreme Court is using formalistic, shut up, he explained, um, the Ring Lardner short story baseball, shut up, he explained, you know, where these formalistic ways of looking at things close off the conversation too soon and uh, prevent the states from engaging in what might end up being, you know, you're right, stupid experiments in trying to perfect democracy. Um, I think that that's the, the bigger story, if you look at the First Amendment cases, is that the court is becoming more uh, snap, snap, snap. And as for the rhetoric point, I couldn't agree more. I'm disappointed that uh, Justice Kagan went this route. But when the Wall Street Journal says, isn't it great, Scalia is delightfully brutal. Don't be surprised um, if we start talking to each other like this. You bet. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like being the moderator because I have to sort of signal we're out of time because it's much more fun to listen and let somebody else do this. Um, but that's my fate. Okay, so we're going to now talk about Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. In 2005, California enacted a law that prohibits the sale or rental of violent video games to minors without parental consent. Associations for the video game and software industries sued to challenge the law as unconstitutional under the First Amendment. This seems to be First Amendment day, or at least First Amendment part of the afternoon. Um, the argument were, was that video games are, are protected under the First Amendment and that ca the California law impermissibly interferes with this expression. The Supreme Court in the 7-2 decision agreed with the associations and struck down the California law. Before I get to the decision, let me give you a little bit of background. A number of states and municipalities have attempted to restrict minors' access to violent video games. 
Most of these states and municipalities based their laws on a 1968 decision, Supreme Court decision called Ginsburg versus New York. There the Supreme Court held that New York could constitutionally regulate a material that is obscene, that is sexually obscene, uh, for minors. Obscenity, the court noted, is not within the area of protected speech. The New York statute that banned the sale of so-called girly magazines to minors, therefore, is a permissible. Um, I, it's fun to read the magazine, the, the opinion, because Justice Brennan, <laughs> just, just having, reading Justice Brennan refer to girly magazines over and over, just, uh, most of the laws banning or restricting minors' access to violent video games are patterned almost verbatim on the New York law that was upheld in Ginsburg, just that the, the uh, legislature substituted in language about violence for language about sex. The video game companies and the like have been uniformly successful in the lower federal courts in getting these laws struck down. Perhaps the most influential opinion on this area was one authored by uh, Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit. And I just want to read a little bit from his opinion, uh, if nothing else, to give you a sense of what really great writing sounds like. So this is Judge Posner, a, a person that I, I, I admire a great deal. Here's a quoting from his opinion. Take the house of the dead. The player is armed with a gun, most, most fortunately because he is being assailed by a seemingly unending succession of hideous axe-wielding zombies, the living dead conjured back to life by voodoo. The zombies have already knocked down and wounded several people who are pleading pitiably for help, and one of the player's duties is to protect those unfortunates from renewed assaults by the zombies. His main task, however, is self-defense. Zombies are supernatural beings, therefore difficult to kill. Repeated shots are necessary to stop them. You can just imagine Judge Posner back in chambers actually playing the game and taking notes. You know, it took me 10 shots to get this one. All right, multiple shots. I don't, I don't think that Judge Posner doubts that this is a serious issue, that, the, that, that violent video games may in fact inflict some psychological harm on minors. But the whimsy of this opinion suggests to me one thing about Judge Posner, that he probably realizes, unlike a lot of his judicial colleagues, he and Judge, Judge Wake uh, realize, unlike a lot of their judicial colleagues, that the universe does not always necessarily revolve around the American judicial axis. Okay, so um, the, these video games have proven universally futile, uh, uh, these video game laws have proven universally futile in the lower, lower, lower federal courts. That's one piece of the background. Another part of the background is the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in a case called United States versus Stevens, which was decided in April of 2010. A, f a federal law prohibited so-called crush videos. These are fetish videos of animals being crushed. Apparently, some people find these sexually uh, titillating. Now, I understand a lot of fetishes and wish I had a few of my own, but this is one that strikes me as a bit, bit uh, out there. Um, from 1791 to the present, the court noted, several forms of expression, including obscenity, fraud, and defamation, fit into a category of unprotected speech, sort of wholly outside the boundaries of the First Amendment. The government, in arguing to uphold this law, distilled from this list or this category a principle that explains which forms of speech are in the category and which aren't. The forms of speech that qualify, if they are, to quote the government's argument, of such slight social value as a step to truth, that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. Videos de depicting outrageous cruelty to animals, the government argued, uh, is uh, qualified by this metric to fit in this category of unprotected speech. But the court wasn't interested in the principle, making sense of why the several forms of expression fit within this category of unprotected speech. Rather, the court, court essentially said that the category was closed. Only if the government could show a lengthy, but heretofore unnoticed historical tradition of not protecting depictions of animal cruelty would the court admit that this sort of expression fit in the category. Since there was no such historical tradition, the crush videos warranted First Amendment protection. Stevens set the stage for Justice Scalia's majority opinion in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. Justice Scalia reject, rejected the argument that violent speech is akin to obscene speech and thus does not merit First Amendment protection. Violence is not sex, Justice Scalia tells us, which is helpful. Uh, furthermore, there's no lengthy historical tradition of restricting children's access to depictions of violence. Justice, as Justice Scalia points out, Grimm's fairy tales are grim indeed, a very clever turn of phrase, and high school reading lists are chock full of such violent texts as the, uh, the Odyssey and Dante's Inferno. Because we haven't traditionally treated violent expressions accessed by children as unprotected for First Amendment principles, he reasons, we have to subject any law that restricts children's access to strict scrutiny. California could not show any compelling justification in limiting children's access to violent video games. The empirical evidence suggesting a link between uh, these violent video games and psychological damage propens or children's propensity to violence 
uh, was quite modest, Justice Scalia insisted. And moreover, California didn't regulate minors' access to other forms of communication or other media that, had, uh, that, that if there was a, a, an, an empirical effect, had the same one. Justice Alito, with the Chief ju uh, Justice joining him, concurred. Justice Alito insisted that the California statute was overbroad and thus uh, was, was impermissibly vague and had to be struck down on that basis. But Justice Alito seemed to want to preserve the possibility that a state could enact a better written statute that would restrict minors' access to violent video games. The chief point was this, that playing violent video games is probably very different than reading violent literature. Video games could be something totally different than what children have traditionally had access to. Before the court dismisses this possibility out of hand, as Justice Scalia does, uh, the possibility of, uh, uh, the, uh, the court should better understand the technology involved. It may simply not make sense to say uh, uh, that just because children have traditionally had access to violent fairy tales, that the First Amendment remains wholly unconcerned by what violent video games might do to young minds. Now things get really wild in Justice Thomas's dissent. Uh, to understand American parenting circa 1787 as one must if one is Justice Thomas, uh, Justice Thomas looked to 18th century Swiss writings authored by Jean-Jacques Rousseau about parenting. Now, he doesn't note in his opinion that Jean-Jacques Rousseau sired five children uh, with, a, uh, with an illiterate, illiterate French maid and uh, promptly and proudly put each of them into an orphanage. Uh, Justice Thomas doesn't mention that fact because he's trying to learn about parenting from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. These writings from the, time of the, the, from the time of the framers indicated that parents had total control over what their children could hear. The framers thus could not possibly have understood, as Thomas argues, that the freedom of speech includes an unqualified right to speak to children without their parents' consent. Finally, Justice Breyer dissented, compiling a lengthy list of articles on the psychological effects of violent games to show that there existed sufficient evidence of a compelling government interest to, um, to protect against psychological harm to minors to justify the California statute. Now, what are we supposed to make of this case? I have absolutely no idea. That's why we have uh, Linda Greenhouse here. I'm not a First Amendment expert, so I'll let others tell you what is important about this. But what jumps out at me is the following. First, if you want a good, good illustration of the difference between uh, Justice Scalia's faint-hearted originalism and Justice Thomas's originalism on steroids, then look to these opinions, because they're a good, a good illustration. As Justice Scalia says, Thomas, quote, cites no case state or federal supporting his view that children have no right to be spoken to without their parents' consent. Well, that doesn't bother Justice Thomas one bit. That's not the point. Second, as a novice reader of the First, Amendment's, uh, First Amendment jurisprudence, I'm struck by how remarkably under-theorized all of this seems. Obscenity is totally unprotected by the First Amendment, and violence comes within the First Amendment's warm embrace. Why the difference? Justice Scalia said, well, that's because obscenity has historically been in the category of unprotected speech. I should note as an initial matter that it was not the case that obscenity was prohibited speech circa 1791. The first prosecution for obscenity in the United States was in 1815. Um, at the time when the Constitution was drafted, English, England and the United States were awash in obscenity, including a famously and, and most notoriously a book called The History of Don B, a 1743 work largely about a hero having orgies with nuns and monks. But let's assume that obscenity has always been prohibited. And not, I would, I would think it's, it has been prohibited for, for reasons, not prohibited because it's obscenity simpliciter, but because of what obscene speech does, the perception of the harm that it causes. The framers may have been right in this judgment, but they may, may have been wrong to think that violent speech without redeeming literary, political, or cultural value poses no similar harm. Although we often engage in ancestor worship in our constitutional law, we don't always. We have, from time to time, been willing to question the social or cultural judgments of our, of our founding fathers. So why is this simple evocation of history sufficient to determine which type of speech goes in this unprotected uh, category and which stays out? When that history is based on what must be some social or cultural judgment, the history without a constant renewal of that social or cultural judgment to me becomes an empty formalism. But I'll turn it, uh, now turn it over to Linda Greenhouse and she can give us a much more enlightened view of what's going on. I'll stand, I'll stand over here because I don't think the folks can actually see too well. So um, just reflecting back on our uh, campaign finance discussion, I'll quote Scarlett O'Hara as saying, I'll think about it tomorrow because tomorrow's another day. I think, I, I think I'll quote Blanche Dubois in Streetcar as saying I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so you've gotten... 
<laughs> so I think from the introduction you got to uh, Brown, formerly Schwarzenegger, <clears throat> against Entertainment Merchants Association, you get a sense that there's an awful lot going on in this case. And it's a lot more complicated than the simple statement that the court by a vote of seven to two uh, invalidated the California statute and said the First Amendment protects the sale of violent video games. Uh, a lot more complicated and a lot more revealing of both, uh, again, not to repeat myself, the mess that the First Amendment is in currently and also the different modes of analysis exemplified by these various justices. I mean, it raises the question, what is this case about? Is it about the rights of video game manufacturers to sell their wares? After all, they were the plaintiffs and they spent a gazillion dollars uh, on the uh, representation. Is it about the rights of children? Is it about the rights of parents to control their children? Uh, is it about the place of violence in the First Amendment pantheon? And another question, what was going on in this case during the eight months from November 2nd of last year to June 27th of this year that it was argued and submitted and pending. By the time the court, this case was decided on the last day of the term, it was by considerable amount the oldest case, oldest argued case on the Supreme Court's docket last term. And uh, if we all live long enough to see the justices' papers open from uh, this case, I'd be willing to bet we've seen lots of kind of switcheroo uh, if not one side to the other side, at least, you know, how to, how to parse this case. There's just a great deal of uh, unresolved tension um, in the case. And, and one question being, as, as you heard me, why did they take this case? There was no conflict in the circuits. And a conflict in the circuits is usually the only reason why uh, the court takes a case that raises some uh, constitutional question. Uh, there was no conflict, and indeed the Ninth Circuit opinion uh, seemed rather compatible with the robust First Amendment jurisprudence that, some might say over-robust First Amendment jurisprudence that animates the court today, uh, especially given the Richard Posner opinion uh, that you heard an excerpt from, uh, and from which Justice Scalia, in his majority opinion here, draws quite liberally. But of course, the court was facing a problem, and that was the 1968 decision, uh, Ginsburg against New York, that was a, a carve out from ordinary First Amendment analysis for, for depictions of sexually explicit material that did not meet the obscenity standard that would apply to adults, and that's what's the key about the Ginsburg case. It was material that was on its face, non-obscene, but would be obscene in the context of being sold to minors when the court upheld that law. Uh, and a query whether that law, given the very strong First Amendment court that we have today, would be upheld uh, today, uh, 40 plus years later. And I actually doubt it, but nobody thought to raise or argue that question. And the court, unlike in its handling of Citizens United, where it ordered re-argument to go back to basics, nobody thought to uh, to re-argue the Ginsburg against New York question. They just found various ways of uh, distinguishing it away. So, uh, as I said, the opinion was unusually revealing. It was, as you've heard, really not a seven to two opinion, but a five to two to one to one opinion. Four really completely different takes on the question. Uh, so just to step back for a minute and, and, and mine these various uh, takes for what they might show us about where these justices are coming to. So the Scalia opinion, uh, which was joined by Kennedy, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, was really a, a kind of a classically liberal slash libertarian view of the First Amendment uh, with a big dose of Scalia's particular brand of originalism, which raises the question of why the others sign on to it, the notion that um, if that, that uh, a, a limitation on content, which is how the court views the statute, would not be upheld unless it was part of, as Scalia said, quote, part of a long, if heretofore unrecognized, tradition of proscription. I think he's the first who recognized this. Um, so you wonder why the others kind of signed on to this kind of squishy originalism. 
And I guess one possible answer might be just exhaustion by the end of this long, long process. Um, Scalia notes, and, and it's worth noting, that uh, this statute was, as he called it, uh, the latest episode in a long series of failed attempts to censor violent entertainment for minors. And he talks about um, drive-in movies. Uh, there was a case back in the 60s, or Zosnick, uh, and the question was if, if uh, a, a drive-in movie was showing and it was sexualist and minors driving by in their parents' cars might see it, uh, could a town prevent those kind of movies, non obscene but just sexually explicit, uh, from being uh, shown in a drive-in movie theater and the old court uh, had said no. Uh, radio, movies, uh, song lyrics, comic books. Comic books were once uh, thought to be incredibly dangerous to the psychological health of American youth and there were all kinds of efforts to ban comic books and in fact um, there was an effort not too many years ago, I mean in very recent times um, a town in New York sought to ban um, trading cards that depicted uh, members of the mob and as being dangerous to youth. And, uh, and the federal court struck that one down uh, right quick. So the Scalia opinion looks at the Ginsburg against New York, at the minors obscenity case as uh, simply inapposite. Uh, just doesn't apply because that was obscenity, that's, that was sex. Obscenity always is, has to be about sex in our First Amendment jurisprudence, Scalia says. But this case, this video case is something new. It's about, it's not Ginsburg, it's not sex, it's ideas, he says. This is about ideas, literature full of violence. Uh, the violence is so explicit as to be really gross and disgusting, as Justice Alito emphasizes in his concurring opinion. Scalia says it does, that doesn't matter, quote, disgust is not a valid basis for restricting expression. So it's a very uh, forceful First Amendment opinion. Uh, Scalia says the state has the power to protect children, if that's what this case is about. But, quote, that does not include a free-floating power to restrict the ideas to which children are exposed. So this is a case about ideas. You could say what ideas, but ideas. And he says it's one thing to enforce a parental prohibition. If parents didn't want children to play violent video games, uh, the state shouldn't stand in their way. But it's another thing to require parental consent, as this case does. That's the insertion of government authority between the parent and the child. And that was the real problem here. Uh, now, the Alito and Roberts opinion, I somehow can't believe it all. It's, they, they started this way. Uh, Alito, having been the author of the sole dissenting opinion in the Stevens case, the Animal Crush video case uh, that you heard about, um, has to really uh, find some way to justify how he could have regarded the limitation on the sale of those videos as constitutional and the limitation on the sale of these video games as unconstitutional. He's got to find some way of reconciling uh, those two positions and so he finds refuge in the void for vagueness um, doctrine. And uh, this case hadn't been argued uh, the question presented and the argument had nothing to do with void for vagueness. Uh, Alito writing this concurring opinion joined by Chief Justice Roberts kind of pulls it out of the air, or the, the, uh, the rabbit out of the hat, uh, saying that in the statute, uh, violent video games are not defined with the requisite specificity that would let somebody know what they are. That doesn't hold water with any of the other seven. Uh, uh, the definition is quite precise and quite familiar, taken, as you heard, you know, directly from the court's obscenity uh, jurisprudence. And there's a reference to community standards. Well, the court's been dealing with that for 40 years. And so the notion, and, and of course, the video game industry has its own, just like the movies, its own uh, rating system, which is uh, part of what the Scalia majority invokes to, to show that um, that there's a least restrictive means of accomplishing the result, the goal of protecting children, the video game's own rating system uh, is apparently rather effective. So the whole void for vagueness um, argument, I don't think uh, really holds up, but they, but, and the, the thrust of the opinion really is um, uh, how necessary this law is if only California had written it a little better. I, Alito has this 
this really um, a, a description of what these video games uh, depict that really does make you squirm. He says, victims are dismembered, decapitated, disemboweled, set on fire, and chopped into little pieces. They cry out in agony and beg for mercy. Blood gushes, splatters, and pools. Severed body parts and gobs of human remains are graphically shown. In some, points, in some games, points are awarded based not only on the number of victims killed, but on the killing technique in place. Huh, this, uh, oh, Ted will maybe agree with me. This to me sounds like John Roberts' writing style, much more than Sam Alito's, I think. I think um, that was the Chief Justice's edition. So, you know, this is not uh, coming from two justices who have too many doubts that this can be regulated and they somehow find refuge in the, in the void for vagueness. So the, the Thomas opinion is preposterous. It really, I mean, it's a parody of originalism. I mean, you really, if you haven't read it, I mean, just go online and read this opinion. Uh, talking about, he was, you know, Cotton Mather, as you know, like we should learn about uh, parental rights. Um, you know, as you heard, children had no rights, founding generation, fathers controlled the family with, quote, absolute authority. So the First Amendment would never have included, quote, a right to speak to minors without going through minors' parents or guardians. He invokes Thomas Jefferson, who he said engaged in rigorous management of his children, you know, while he was having an affair with his slave. I mean, I don't know. Um, parent, he's a in the founding generation, parents were expected to direct the development and education of their children and ensure that bad habits would not take root. Well, okay. Um, parents had total authority over what children read. So, you know, you read this and you think, what would Justice Thomas say, for instance, about husbands' authority over wives, which certainly was total in the founding generation, right? And, you know, we amended the Constitution to let women vote, but we never passed the ERA. So, you know, the, is the interpretation of the Constitution to guarantee uh, equality between the sexes, uh, you know, just some make way because the founders never would have gone for that? I mean, th there's just no way that the analysis uh, exemplified in, in this opinion uh, can possibly comport with um, a modern notion of what the First Amendment is, what the Supreme Court is, what constitutional interpretation is. But, I'll let you decide that for yourselves. Uh, the Breyer dissenting opinion is also in a way a parody, a self-parody of, of Stephen Breyer's um, exquisitely quasi-scientific evidence-based uh, balancing test. Uh, he, he makes some very good points. He says the relevant category uh, in this case, what we're really dealing with is not uh, you know, is violence, is it analogous to affinity, blah, blah. But it, this is a case about protecting children. So that's the compelling interest. The compelling interest is in protecting the welfare of children. And that that's what California has to show that it has accomplished uh, by um, a properly tailored and uh, not overbroad or not underbroad uh, means. Uh, he says the statute is not, not vague. Uh, strict scrutiny is required. By the way, the Alito and Roberts concurring opinion takes issue with strict scrutiny and strongly suggests that in this context, although they don't quite explain why we don't need strict scrutiny. Uh, Breyer says here that, that really this is just a modest restriction. It's not a complete restriction on speech because uh, nobody's kept from playing the video games that they may possess and, of course, uh, adults can buy the games for children or can authorize the sale of games to children. Uh, and he says there's considerable evidence that the statute furthers the state's compelling interest. Uh, what evidence? Well, he says, there's lots and lots of studies. And he's got a 15-page appendix that lists uh, just one peer-reviewed scientific article after another. He has one appendix for the articles that uh, claim to show that great psychological harm flows to children who play violent video games. He's got a shorter but still pretty long appendix and articles that take the other position. Uh, and evidently somebody in his chambers, I assume his law clerks and not himself, has at least looked at each one of these dozens and dozens of articles. And the appendix is there, if I, if I understand the purpose of it, um, not so that readers are going to 
go on JSTOR or Hein Online or whatever and pull down all these articles, but just to show that there was a great deal of evidence one way or the other that the court failed to acknowledge and that the lower court also failed to acknowledge. So what are the implications of this? Well, uh, coming up this current term, we have another uh, effort to protect children by federal statute, uh, federal regulation, and that's the, uh, Fox, the new iteration of uh, Fox against Federal Communications Commission. This is a case about the, uh, the regulation of, uh, or the ban of, on fleeting expletives on television. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how um, the Scalia majority uh, tree reconciles their protection of violent video games with, uh, with the court has been rather indulgent toward these, um, these fleeting expletives. Uh, if you're going back to the uh, Seven Dirty Words case um, back in the, uh, in the late 70s. So whether uh, the First Amendment on steroids that we're all living with will swoop down and, um, and block the FCC from regulating these fleeting expletives uh, remains to be seen. And as I mentioned in my early remarks, you know, what's ultimately, I mean, this is just a, a chapter in the unfolding saga of uh, a very empowered First Amendment that is um, governing lots of aspects of our um, citizen lives, corporate lives, commercial speech, uh, corporate political speech, uh, all these, uh, you know, bearing some relationship one to the other and all of which bear uh, very close watching. We only have about, uh, 15 minutes, or 10, 10 to 15 minutes uh, left in the session, so unfortunately we're gonna keep remarks a little uh, short for the, for the other three panelists. Uh, so I w why don't we go um, to uh, Mr. Cruz and then onto the team. Well, I guess this case concerns uh, violent video games and, and the Stevens case concerned animal cruelty. Uh, so, so I probably should start with just, just as a matter of full disclosure that, that, that on my iPhone I, I do actually have Angry Birds um, which combines both of those. Um, <laughs> for those of you that know the game, you get it. For the rest of you, ask your kids. Um, you know, th this case I think is, is an interesting and, and, and difficult case. I think this is a case the court struggled with. Um, you know, one perspective on this case, I, I think the state of California uh, did a singularly poor job advocating its position. Um, and, and, and I say this, um, you know, I had a little bit of experience with this case because earlier this year, actually, the conference Linda and I were both at, uh, it was a Supreme Court preview conference, and it began by doing a mood of this case. And, and rather foolishly, um, I volunteered to be the lawyer that argues this case, uh, and Judge Michael McConnell argued on the other side. Um, which is always a foolish thing to prepare to do a moot in front of nine justices, including Linda, who was one of the nine, and it was a, a panel of, of Supreme Court advocates and, and reporters. And so you have to do the preparation of getting ready for an argument, but, but alas, Judge, you don't have a paying client for one of these moots. So it's, uh, it's a little harder to justify to your partners while you're putting the time in to do that. Um, and so I found myself in the position of arguing California's position against Judge Michael McConnell, one of the premier Supreme Court advocates in the country. And, and in looking at California's brief, I, I found their positions utterly indefensible uh, and, and in fact made the decision, much to Judge McConnell's frustration, to completely jettison what California had said and come up with an entirely new theory. Uh, and in particular, California made two, I think, very, very bad strategic judgments. One, they conceded at the outset video games are pure speech. Um, I think once that concession was made, they were on incredibly perilous terrain. And, and at least in the mood argument, uh, I made the argument that, look, sure, video games has a, have a speech component. There's a narrative to them. But games as a general matter are not speech. Parcheesi is not speech. Ping pong is not speech. Uh, 
Uh, and with respect to a video game that has a narrative component, it is mixed between speech and conduct. There are, there are components of both. Um, that in turn led to, I think, the second even worse strategic decision California made, which is that they argued for, uh, that they argued for rational basis review, which was the Ginsburg standard. Now, I agree with Linda that if Ginsburg were argued today, it would come out differently. Interestingly enough, it was Justice Brennan that agreed with Ginsburg initially, that lion of the First Amendment, but we're in a different world, and, and I don't think Ginsburg would be decided the same today. But in Ginsburg, they applied rational basis review to girly magazines, to restrictions on girly magazines. And California put all their eggs in the, in the basket of rational basis review as the appropriate standard for violent video games because it's the same as the girly magazines in Ginsburg. I think that was the chances that any of the justices were going to apply rational basis review, and especially that a majority of the justices were, I think, was zero. Um, and so at least in this moot, what I argued is I said, look, if it's right that it's mixed between speech and conduct, there's been a standard the courts applied for years for that. That's the O'Brien standard, which is intermediate scrutiny, and then made the argument that this satisfied intermediate scrutiny. Now, I'm not certain that's correct. Um, I mean, I think that was a sounder litigation strategy than the strategy California pursued. Um, I do think, had the case been litigated that way, it would have presented the issues in sharper relief because, because California really presented a straw man. It ended up in our moot, much to my astonishment, the, the fake court voted 6-3 to uphold the California statute, and it was a panel that consisted in significant part of journalists, so that was that was really quite astonishing. Uh, I, I, not to suggest the same result would have obtained in the court, but I do think that was an aspect in the decision making that California's strategy was suspect. It's not a pro-speech court. It's a selectively pro-speech court. Um, Sumum, uh, if it calls it government speech, there's no First Amendment analysis at all. Um, it's not particularly pro minors, minors pro speech. If it's at school <coughs> and the sign says bong hits for Jesus, um, they can be punished. And they can be punished sort of summarily. What happens, I think, is, is the following. You put, you start speaking in absolutist, uh, formalist tones with respect to the First Amendment and oppose, impose strict scrutiny in the face of people's sensible anxiety about the consequences of speech and something weird happens. Um, what happens, I think, is that it migrates elsewhere. And one of the ways in which it'll show up is, okay, we're only gonna say that the free speech principle purely applies here and elsewhere. We're gonna do something dramatically differently because people get it. There's something wrong with showing kids some things um, and having them exposed to some of these things. And so that instinct doesn't go away. Um, the reason I think the, key, the case doesn't teach well, it doesn't read well, they're in silos because I think that they, for once, actively engage the notion of a child as a, as a First Amendment life and being. And, and they say that the child has this First Amendment right, even possibly to receive ideas. That's really out of register with almost everything else they've said about children and free speech, short of Mary Beth Tinker not uh, losing her rights at the schoolhouse gate. So I think, um, it's, it's pro-speech, yes, and, and beware of ab First Amendment absolutism because it ten can produce some real restrictions on it in other environments. The uh, public forum doctrine, Holder itself last term, which I, got, I think got insufficient attention, <coughs> including by us. Um, is this a libertarian court? <clears throat> oh, come on, no. Um, it sounds like it in this regard, um, um, but they're gonna allow, if it ever gets to them again, that you have to be counseled. An adult woman has to be counseled before she gets an abortion. Maybe we should have an obligatory counseling before you purchase Mortal Kombat. Um, I, you know, I, I, you know it, it's, it's a selective indifference to the libertarian consequences, I think, that's not across the board, even applied um, to adults. Why did they take it? Why did it take so long? Kagan, Justice Kagan said this was the most difficult course, uh, uh, case for her last term. Um, I think that Justices Alito and Justice Roberts were very disturbed by this. And, uh, and I think Justice Roberts in particular, he's got young children, and I think you know, that there was this, this was tough for them on that visceral, you know, sort of human level. Um, but I also think that Linda's exactly right. There's a the football of FCC versus Fox, something's a coming. 
And, um, and I think that when they get to that case next year, we're going to see if this thin line between indecency uh, where she doesn't have a shirt on and indecency where she's being uh, chopped up, killed, uh, even virtually, will hold in that case. What I think is interesting is I think Pacifica looks more and more absurd. Just absolutely, you know, how can that be maintained? And I think Scalia tries to mark out a position where he could make a distinction between sexual indecency and this other kind. Um, but for what it's worth, and I said it to my students, uh, the original story of Sleeping Beauty, she was raped. Um, so if we're going to talk about children being exposed to, I said, oh, come on, come on, she was raped. Yeah, in the nighttime, came in and then had a baby while she was sleeping um, against her will. That's what you call a rape. Um, and I think that this notion that young children aren't exposed to sex is, 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 is as nutty as the notion that they're not exposed to violence. And so there's a lot in the opinion they're going to have to live with as early as next term in thinking about the universe of indecency, violence, even if they're not equivalent. Um, but it's not a pro-speech court across the board, not by a wide margin. I just have a few comments. Uh, r remember that the, the, these uh, video games are a different form of medium in that uh, they are interactive in a unique way uh, and computer stuff in general is easily becomes addictive um, and one of the main reasons the player controls the rate of play and by the way that's something in, in the gambling sociology and psychology of gambling it, when the player controls the rate of play that is the most addictive form of gambling so that's why slot machines are uh, are, are uh, so uh, dangerous in terms of addiction all of that applies to these extremely violent video games and um, draws on a fundamental uh, concern, partly because it is repellent and disgusting, uh, but also I suggest because it gets far from what originally was and now has become the core values of, of free speech. Obviously, political speech is what the framers were talking about, but our free speech doctrine has evolved, and I think all of us think uh, to great benefit, to a doctrine of protection and freedom of cultural change. I doubt you'll find anybody in the, in the founders talking about that, but that is in fact what our First Amendment uh, doctrine has become, and it is a very good thing, especially when we look around at the societies that do not have freedom of cultural change. Well, wh what do these extremely violent videos for children have to do with that? Um, it, it strikes to a, a core dissatisfaction for, for some people. And this case reminded me of a, a comment I saw uh, that uh, Justice Souter gave in an interview at Harvard about a year ago I saw on CNN where he said Le legal doctrine is the, the creation of a fabric of principle to give predictability to the law, but when, when legal doctrine uh, ce ceases to vindicate core intuitive values, it, it really cannot last. It, has to be changed. So I think what's underlying here is a, a sense here about this extremely violent videos for children that it doesn't really touch into those um, important First Amendment purposes. Now, what was interesting to me was the, the absolutist uh, the tone of the majority opinion from uh, Justice Scalia. Basically says, hey, there are no new exceptions. There aren't any. Well, why not? I mean, obscenity was a new exception. Well, maybe part of the reason is that we have such a terrible experience with discovering free speech in the 20th century and how awful it went when it was in a, a balancing test where judges and legislators could weigh the mean difference and it basically disappeared. It, it became an instrument of, of political and, and social uh, oppression. And there may be a fear of doing the same thing with violent video games. And you all know the principle that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I suspect what could be said for Justice Scalia's opinion here is a little known corollary of that. Uh, by the way, it's known as Wake's corollary. Um, and it says, if it's too hard to fix, leave it broken. <laughs> and and th th it may be that it's better to, to rely on, in, in, embrace this sweeping First Amendment constitutional protection, rely on the self-regulation in the uh, industry, rely on parents, and, and suffer the price that will go, that falls between the cracks with that. You all don't know this, but uh, Judge Wake's computer just crashed while he was uh, making those remarks. He was able to quote Justice Souter from memory 
and uh, give, his, give his remarks nonetheless. Um, we will take a 15-minute break and reconvene at 2.45. Is that right? Uh, so thank you very much, and hope to see you for the second. I'm trying to be prompt. There's something in the Arizona State Constitution about not having to wear a wool suit for any minute longer than one has to. So we're gonna, gonna move on. The next case on our docket is the Leal Garcia case. My goal with my presentation today is to hang a nice, nice, fat, juicy curve right over the plate and watch Ted Cruz smack it out of the park. So I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can do that. Leal Garcia versus Texas is not a decision on the merits. Instead, it's the rejection of a petition for a stay of execution. Unlike the other behemoths that we had to read for today, this, the, the, this case involves several mercifully short opinions, uh, three pa pages in the case of the majority and six pages in the case of Justice Breyer's dissent. This begs the question, why exactly are we talking about this case today with so many significant decisions rendered by the Supreme Court this past term? The Leal Garcia case is a wonderful vehicle for thinking about some very fascinating and mind-addling problems involving international law and federalism. This is a death penalty case, and as with all death penalty cases, there's one fact that I am certain is beyond any shred of metaphysical or physical doubt. Somebody was killed in a brutal, horrific crime. Early on the morning of May 21st, 1994, a 16-year-old girl named Adria Sauceda was brutally killed in San Antonio, Texas after attending a party the previous evening. The story, as I understand it, went something like this. Audrey had been, uh, had been essentially gang raped for several hours at the party while she was severely intoxicated. Representing himself as rescuing, this, uh, rescuing Audrey from this prolonged sexual assault, Leal put her in his car and claimed he would drive her home. Her body was found a short while later uh, after uh, Leal's brother came back to the party with, in a great state of anxiety um, saying that his brother had just killed someone. Um, I'll spare you the lurid details, but this is just to say that she'd been brutally raped with a stick and brutally beaten and strangled to death. There were bite marks covering her body. Leal was prosecuted for rape, kidnapping, and murder, convicted on July 10, 1995, and then uh, sentenced to the death penalty on July 11, 1995. Up to this point, Leal is a standard death penalty case, which is to say not standard at all, but nonetheless a standard death penalty case. What makes it more difficult is that Leal was a, is a citizen of Mexico, or was a citizen of Mexico. This fact is significant because of the international legal obligations it implicates. In 1969, the United States ratified the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Article 36 of the convention provides that a person has a right to consular notification in the event that that person is arrested in a foreign country. The idea is that the consulate can help, uh, help the person navigate a foreign legal system, help obtain competent counsel and the like. The United States also ratified an optional protocol, the Vienna Convention. The optional protocol provides that disputes arising out of the convention shall lie within the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Now, I know what many of you are thinking at this point. How could it be that the United States would voluntarily subject itself to some kangaroo court in The Hague? Was it that well, it must have been some president from the Blame America Democratic Party, a Blame America first Democrat Party, I botched, I botched my joke. Uh, <laughs> that signed these treaties, but this is not the case. It's 1969, it's the Nixon administration. More, the more likely scenarios for what happened was that the United Nations sent its black helicopters in and made force President Nixon to sign these treaties by, at gunpoint, or more likely that President Nixon was tripping on acid because it was, after all, 1969. <laughs> now, how is this relevant to lay out? It turns out that state officials in a bunch of states, including Arizona and Texas, weren't informing Mexican nationals of their Vienna Convention rights to consular notification when they were arrested for capital offenses. On behalf of 51 of its nationals, including Leal, Mexico sued the United States in the International Court of Justice. In 2004, in a decision called Avena, the ICJ ruled in, um, uh, in Mexico's favor. Mexico had asked as a remedy that the ICJ invalidate these convictions and require the United States and the, the various states to retry all of these defendants. The ICJ was more restrained in the remedy it ordered. It ordered that each of these defendants receive a hearing to determine whether the failure to inform him of his right to consular assistance prejudiced his defense in some manner. Now here's the problem. None of these 51 nationals, as far as I'm aware, had raised the convention violation before or at trial. 
under the post-conviction relief laws of most states, defense is not raised at trial with, with some exceptions like ineffective assistance of counsel, cannot be raised for the first time in post-conviction proceedings like habeas corpus. The ICJ thus ordered that state procedural default laws that limited what one could argue post-trial should not apply to bar this consular assistance hearing. In response to this decision, President Bush issued a very curious memorandum stating that the United States will discharge its obligations under Avena by having state courts give effect to the decision. The United States Supreme Court decided the import of the Avena decision and this bizarre statement from President Bush in a 2008 case called Medellin versus Texas, argued by none other than Ted Cruz uh, for, for, for uh, uh, Texas, not Medellin. Jose Medellin, like Leal, was, uh, he won the case. Should, he just won. He's, that's all we should say. Uh, Jose Medellin, like Leal, was, was one of the 51 be purported beneficiaries of the Avena decision. Uh, uh, Medellin argued that Texas was obliged to provide him with this hearing on the consular assistance issue, uh, notwithstanding the state procedural default law. The Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision said no. The Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution provides, in pertinent part, that this Constitution and the laws of the United States and all treaties shall be the supreme law of the land, and that judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. On its surface, the Supremacy Clause would seem to, to dictate that the ICJ's judgment procured under the Vienna Convention and the Optional Protocol would displace Texas's procedural default law. Medellin and Leal and the 49 others would get their, their hearings. But um, this is too neat and quick. Let me try to simplify a re ridiculously complicated issue. There are two types of treaties, essentially. There are what are called self-executing treaties. These are those that have automatic domestic effect with, upon the Senate's ratification without any uh, implementing legislation. Federal and state officials are bound to abide by the treaties once, uh, by, abide by self-executing treaties without anything more. There are also non-self-executing treaties. These are those that require implementing legislation from Congress in addition to the Senate's ratification before they have domestic effect. Now, in reality, there are both, there are, some treaties are both partially self-executing and partially not self-executing. In some instances, treaties, uh, ex officials are bound to apply treaties in a certain way, but private individuals may not be able to raise treaty defenses to in, in particular prosecutions or the like. The question in Medellin was, was, was the Avena judgment, the ICJ decision procured under the Vienna Convention and the optional protocol, itself self-executing, such that an individual criminal defendant was, would be vested with a right that he could use against a state? The majority said no. The majority concluded that absent a federal statute giving criminal defendants the right to enforce the Vienna Convention, a defendant or the judgment procured under the Vienna Convention, a defendant could not invoke the convention in the supremacy clause to trump state procedural default law. As the effect of President Bush's memorandum, the court just said, forget it, forget Bush. It's Congress's job to pass implementing legislation. The president can't assume this power himself. Medellin's petition for habeas corpus was denied. Leal was another of the supposed 51 beneficiaries of the ICJ's Avena decision. He filed a petition for habeas corpus asking that he get an Avena hearing notwithstanding Texas procedural default law. One would think that Medellin, the Medellin decision would render this petition wholly meritless. But the Medellin decision I just described wasn't all that the court decided for Jose Medellin. Right before his execution, Jose Medellin petitioned for a stay. A bill to implement the Vienna Convention had just been introduced into Congress. Medellin argued that he should have a stay to allow Congress to act on the bill. The Supreme Court denied the stay. The possibility of legislative action was too remote. Uh, the court concluded just the bare introduction of the bill with no executive branch support is not enough to uh, merit a stay. Moreover, there would be no possibility that Medellin would in the end benefit from the Avena hearing. Okay, well, Leal petitioned for a stay this past summer, arguing that his case satisfied the conditions that the Medellin court found wanting when it denied the petition for the stay. Working with Patrick Leahy, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, President Obama, the, President Obama, the Obama administration, introduced um, a bill to implement the, the Avena decision, and Leahy indicated his desire to hold hearings on the bill uh, this July, this past July. Leahy asked for a stay to last until the end of this Congress, that is January 3rd, 2012, to give time for Congress to act. The Obama administration filed an amicus brief joining Leal's request and stressing the severe foreign policy consequences that would ensue should Leal be executed without his Avena hearing.
The administration in his brief noted that Leal had already been on death row for something like 14 years. A few more months would hardly be prejudicial to Texas's interests. In a 5-4 decision, the court denied the request for the stay and Leal was executed. Leal made what I would argue is a strategic mistake. His lawyers argued that he had a due process right to, to a stay in light of the possibility that Congress would act. Now surely this is wrong. No one has a due process right to uh, legislative time. The majority made easy mincemeat of this argument. But what, what, what the Obama administration's argument was much more deferential. The Obama administration simply asked the court to exercise its equitable discretion to give Congress a little more time. In light of the foreign policy consequences, the Obama, Obama administration asked, surely a, little, a few more months would not be harmful. The majority dismissed this request out of hand. Now, I think this decision is interesting for several reasons. First, the opinion evinces to me a fair amount of contempt for the uh, other branches of government. Second, the decision highlights how problems can slip through our federalism cracks. Now, Texas, I am sure, and I am, I, I am a, a Texan, um, Texas, I am sure, would have hollered about federalism, state sovereignty, the Alamo, high school football, barbecue in Lockhart, and, and kolaches in LaGrange, uh, until it went blue in the face had the court granted the stay. But to my mind, this case makes Texas my home state, my roots are in fact in boots, the state where my par parents continue to live, seem like a petulant teenager. Justice Stevens and his Medellin concurrence stressed that the Supremacy Clause gives the state of Texas, as it does Congress, a legal duty to implement the Vienna Convention. If Texas wants to be treated like a full-fledged sovereign, then it should act like a full-fledged sovereign, that is, to abide by its treaty obligations. It has not done so, unlike, say, Oklahoma, which accepted the Avena judgment and altered its own its, its state procedural default laws accordingly. The third uh, and an interesting issue I will not talk about and just uh, let you think about on your own, think about a third interesting issue um, because I've run out of time. Uh, and uh, I think I've now uh, hung my curve over the plate and I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, um, Ted Cruz does with this. Thank you. Well, thank you. I will say I am uh, waxing emotional right now at the invocation of the Alamo and high school football. Uh, that, 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 that truly, uh, uh, that, 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 there, there ain't nothing better. Um, let me talk about first the Medellin case, which really sets the substantive decision that sets the stage, and then let me su subsequently talk about Humberto Leal. Uh, and what I want to say on, on Medellin is really three things. One, what the stakes were in the case. Number two, I want to talk about the, the litigation strategy we pursued that, that yielded the, the result. And number three, the broader context, uh, internationally. Number one, the stakes. There were two principal issues before the court in Medellin. The first was, does the International Court of Justice, which is the judicial arm of the United Nations, otherwise known as the World Court, does the World Court have the power to bind the U.S. justice system? The decision in Havana purported to do that. Uh, it purported to order the United States to reopen the convictions of 51 murderers across the country in the United States. And it, and it notably is the first time in history a foreign tribunal has attempted to bind the U.S. justice system. Uh, that was a big deal. Uh, that was a major question. Does a foreign tribunal have the ability to conclusively bind our justice system? On its own, that would have made it a, a fascinating case and, and, and a difficult case. But the president's order really, really sent it through the looking hole. Because what the president did, President George W. Bush signed a two-paragraph order that purported to order the state courts to obey the world court. Now, what's interesting about the president's order, it did not claim to be doing so under the mandate of the treaties at issue. The president's order claimed to be doing so under the inherent power of the presidency to promote international comedy. ITY, not EDY. <laughs> that takes a minute. <laughs> the argument of the Justice Department was essentially our allies will be far happier if we do this. Therefore, the President has the authority to order it to be so. Uh, 
Um, the Department of Justice, to its credit, admitted that this order was, quote, unquote, unprecedented. Uh, quite literally lacking in precedent, no president in history has ever claimed such an expansive authority to set aside state laws based on the unilateral power of the president. That, those two issues, uh, you know, th this Kaylee raised questions along every structural axis of government. It raised questions, federal government versus states. It raised questions of international law versus domestic law. It raised questions of the president vis-a-vis -vis Congress, the president vis-a-vis -vis the courts, and with, with what I called a Mobius twist, the president vis-a-vis -vis the state courts, which is just plain weird. So those were the stakes. Now, now what was the litigation strategy? You know, I have to say when this case, I think this case is actually a good illustration of how in every litigation the most important question is what is the narrative? Framing the narrative in the case, I think, is 80% of winning any case. Now, the narrative on the other side, Medellin's narrative, was very easy to understand. Can Texas, this rogue state, this petulant teenager, can it thumb its nose at the international treaty obligations of the United States? Can it tell the entire world to go jump in a lake? And you know how those Texans are about the death penalty. That was his narrative. It's a very simple, straightforward narrative. Now, I'll tell you, if that's what the case is about, can Texas choose to disregard the binding treaty obligations of the United States of America? We lose that case. That's not complicated. That is a narrative you lose. I think most states litigating this case would have chosen to litigate it as a federalism case, would have chosen to embrace the themes of state sovereignty. You can't tell us what to do. We very consciously didn't do that. And we didn't do that because if we'd litigated it as a federalism case, we would have stepped right into the other side's narrative. We would have embraced the story of can Texas thumb its nose? So instead, the opening line of our summary of argument was this is a separation of powers case. And we litigated it as a separation of powers case instead of a federalism case. Now, what does that mean? Roman numeral one in the brief, the first argument was the president's order violates the authority of Congress. And that was, in fact, our principal argument. Now, why is that the case? Well, when Congress, when the Senate ratified these treaties, it did so under the explicit understanding that these treaties would not be self-executing insofar as they would not be enforceable in federal courts. There was extensive testimony in the Senate where the representatives from the Department of State were asked, what effect will this have in federal courts? None whatsoever, Your Honor. That was the understanding the Senate had when it ratified. Uh, and in fact, it had been the position of the United States government for over 30 years that these treaties were not self-executing. They were not enforceable in federal courts. That had been the consi consistent opinion of every administration right up until the George W. Bush administration, actually the Clinton administration. Ironically enough on this issue in an earlier case came in and said, we have no authority to do anything on this. This is beyond the constitutional authority of the president to do anything on this. That was the Clinton administration's position. The Bush administration's position, it seized on a heretofore undiscovered presidential power. And we argued that was fundamentally contrary to the authority of Congress and vigorously defended the prerogative of Congress. The decision on whether to make a treaty self-executing, binding in our courts, is the decision that is integral at ratification. And if the Senate ratifies a treaty under the understanding that it won't be binding in court, a president can't unilaterally change that years after the fact. Now, our second argument, again, wasn't federalism. It was the president's order violates the authority of this court. And the U.S. Supreme Court had a couple of terms earlier decided a related issue in a case called Sanchez-Yamas. And it had concluded that the decision 
of the World Court in Havana was not binding and enforceable. And the president subsequently came in and issued an order to the state court saying, I'm ordering you to follow it. And I have to say as a lawyer, this, the most unique privilege of this case, it is not often one gets to go into court and argue as a principal authority, Marbury versus Madison. But our argument was verbatim, it is emphatically the province and duty of this court to say what the law is. And the position of the U.S. Department of Justice is a state court looking at two pieces of paper, a majority opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States in Sanchez James, and a two-paragraph memorandum from the president should obey the memorandum and disregard the decision of the Supreme Court. And we argue the president doesn't have the unilateral authority to do that. And it was then only after both of those arguments that we got to the federalism issues as a tertiary argument. Now, teeing that up, the U.S. Supreme Court ended up agreeing with us across the board. Chief Justice Roberts wrote what I think is a terrific opinion that concluded the Avena decision was not binding in U.S. courts, and the president had no authority to order the state courts to obey it. Now, the third point I mentioned is the broader context, and I think there are a couple of things that are worth understanding to really get the joke. Uh, number one, the Avena decision on its face was about power. There's actually a concurring opinion in which the vice chair of the court says, I don't believe the treaties say this, but I don't like the death penalty. And so I'm joining this because I don't like the death penalty and I want to see if we can restrict the United States. Now here's what really underlies the lie in it. We had, Texas had 90 foreign nations come in against us in the Medellin case. Do you know how many foreign nations treat decisions of the world court as binding in their courts? I'll give you a hint, it's a round number. Zero. There is no nation on earth that treats decisions of the world court as binding in their own courts. Neither is there any nation on earth that treats the Vienna Convention as self-executing, as enforceable in their courts. If you or I went to Mexico and made the identical arguments that are being made, we would be laughed out of court in the Mexican courts. And that's true in every court on earth. And in fact, the second iteration of the joke is the whole fight here was these individuals had a trial where the state paid for lawyers, in Medellin's case, paid for two lawyers who vigorously defended him. They failed to raise the, the claim under the Vienna Convention. And the usual rule in U.S. criminal procedures, if you don't raise a claim at your trial, you can't come back years later on habeas and say, hey, you know, that trial we had, there's this claim I should have raised. Absent a few unique exceptions, if you don't raise it at trial, it's forfeited. And what the what Avena said is, no, 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 you can't forfeit this claim. It doesn't matter that they didn't raise it. They can raise it at any time, notwithstanding your procedural default rules. Now, here's the second half of the joke. In most of the foreign countries at issue, there are no habeas proceedings. There is no second bite at the apple. I mean, we create a second bite at the apple, a collateral vehicle to challenge convictions. And most of the other nations, you're convicted, you're done. And it underscored what I think this fight was ultimately about, which was a question of U.S. sovereignty. Is the authority of administration of justice going to remain the U.S. Supreme Court and Congress and the President? And I'll tell you an interesting exchange. This case we actually argued twice in front of the court. The first time, uh, you know, because one argument the other side said is, well, the Vienna Convention essentially handed over the authority to make binding adjudications to, to this court. And, and Justice Scalia had, had a fascinating exchange with my opposing counsel um, where, where he asked him, he said, counsel, do you think it's possible that the president could sign a treaty making Kofi Annan the commander in chief of the United States Armed Forces? And, and counsel on the other side, did not squarely answer that question. Uh, let me say that was a difficult question. And, and Justice Scalia's follow-up is, well, if the, a treaty can't give away the core constitutional functions of the president, 
why do you think a treaty could give away the core constitutional functions of the judiciary to say what federal law is? Uh, and that was one of the many difficult and, and important wrinkles in this case. All right, all of that's Medellin. Let me quickly talk about Leal. And I actually think that's the right division of labor because I think Leal should have been a very, very simple case. Medellin is the binding decision. Leal had no legal arguments. He had no arguments that the Vanna decision was binding. He had no arguments that the president's order was binding. He had no legal basis to say, because of this law, which one would think in a court that should be what one, one is arguing, this execution should be stayed. Other than there's a bill that's been introduced in Congress, which may at some point pass. And if it passes, it may create a new procedural right of review, perhaps. And couple of things are interesting. Number one, the Obama administration agreed with him on that. Now, what's a little strange about that, you know, the argument, just a couple of months. You hard-hearted, petulant teenagers, why not a couple of months? The Vienna decision, uh, the, the Medellin decision was decided in 2008. It's been three years since the, since the Medellin decision. Congress hasn't passed this bill. The chances, realistically, of this pill, bill passing this Congress, again, I think, is a round number, which everyone knew. I mean, that was part of the game. They know that Congress is not going to pass this bill. And so the argument is give Congress a little more time, even though in the last three years they haven't passed this bill, because they might pass the bill even though they're not going to pass the bill. But I do think it's interesting also, Medellin was decided 6-3. In addition, uh, Justice Stevens voted with the majority. Um, this case was 5-4, and I do think it was interesting that both Justice Kagan and, and Justice Sotomayor voted with the dissent. Um, that is interesting. I will say that does not augur well for the respect they intend to give to the Medellin decision should one addis additional justice go to that court. Uh, and if that interpretation is correct, I think that is indeed quite troubling. Uh, because I think a decision the other way in the Medellin de de case, a decision that either A, gives a foreign tribunal the authority to bind our courts, or B, gives the president the authority to order the states to obey a foreign tribunal, would be deeply, deeply troubling. I'll say one final point that just sort of is an interesting aside. Um, on the president's order, one of the things we did in Medellin, we had a great many amici from, from all sorts of different sides. Uh, and, and one of the most interesting is, is we had a law professor's brief uh, that was joined uh, by Professor Erwin Chemerinsky and Professor John Yoon. Now, I am willing to bet that that has never before happened in the history of the universe. And it may well never again happen. As you know, John Yoon is probably the most vigorous defender of executive authority in the academy. And it's fair to say Professor Shemerinsky is not. Uh, and yet with both of them, and both are our friends and, and, and people I admire quite a bit, with both of them, the argument I made in terms of the president's order, I said, look, this is, is I, I mean, I personally am a believer in a robust presidency, but the power being assur asserted here is breathtaking. And it has a potential to be abused. And I said, look, imagine it being abused right or left. If the president has the authority to set aside a state law with which he or she disagrees, in the name of international comedy, I used two examples. This was back in 2008, so I used two examples. One I used for those on the right side of the aisle, the most terrifying thing they could imagine, which at the time was President Hillary Clinton. Um, and I said, you know, look, if you imagine a President Hillary Clinton, she could, with this power, easily set aside, for example, capital punishment laws in all of the states that have them. They are clearly anathema to many of our allies. It would promote comedy in a very significant way. A president could set aside marriage laws in the interest of allowing gay marriage. A president could set aside any domestic law he or she disagreed with. And, and for those on the left, I used something even scarier. I tried to pick the most frightening thing they could imagine, President Dick Cheney. Uh, and it had its effect. There were some white knuckles and trembling when I, when I invoked that particular specter. 
But I said, you know, look, if a president has the authority to set aside state laws with which he or she disagrees and that, that dismay our allies, you know, California's emissions laws have significant effects on global commerce. If you could just set them aside, or tort laws, punitive damages impact global commerce. And if you had a president with the ability to say, with the stroke of a pen, these state laws are gone, that's truly a powerful step. And, and so we tried to unify all the arguments the state of Texas presented behind a, a basic separation of powers principle that to set aside the laws of a democratically elected legislature, it takes at the federal level two or more branches acting in harmony. And the president cannot do so unilaterally, and that ultimately is what the court agreed. I, I very, very much enjoy having a chance to come down here, and when I do, I uh, try to cast my comments toward the law students and young lawyers and things that would be of interest to them. But this time I have to cast this in terms of the perspective of a judge. Um, reading this case is uh, powerful and poignant when you look at it because judges have uh, a great deal of discretion. They have enormous discretion in terms of case processing and case management. Uh, and looking, re and I did not research the depth of the background that Ted has, so that was very fascinating to hear all of that. Uh, but looking at that, I asked myself, well, what would I do? And the answer is, you try to manage things in ways that do not cause unnecessary delay, but that allow uh, for things to be processed so mistakes are avoided and if, if made can be fixed. So there is a natural temptation looking at this to think, well, what's the harm with uh, some more uh, further stay? And w without the uh, extensive background you have on the treaty and whatnot, I saw this, I asked myself, what would I do? Actually, in this, the way death penalty works is the death warrant is issued in Arizona, the state Supreme Court issues the death warrant. And then state, you, you may have federal habeas and district court after that that goes through the Court of Appeals. You can go straight to the Supreme Court from, and by the way, they do all at the same time in the last two or three days, in every case. I, I've been to, through two of them in the last six <coughs> months where my orders were either silently or affirmatively affirmed within 24 hours by the Arizona Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit, the United States Supreme Court. So, uh, and it, it's a powerful and a poignant thing to have to do. Um, if one, if, if one is the court, if you're a judge on the court is issuing the death warrant, you have that discretion. It's your judgment. I think beyond that, then to me, it's the federalism issues that um, sitting in the seat of the federal district judge will I do see these. Um, it is then a matter of the law as a, and, and respect for the state court, and there has to be a legal basis to stay that. Uh, it's, I don't have the discretion, say, in a habeas case, or, or it might be a civil rights case, a 1983 case that is trying to delay an execution uh, for other grounds. Um, and there it's a matter of the proper relationships between uh, courts. And for the putting, putting on a hat of one of what uh, Felix Frankfurter called in a private letter, the nine popes, um, it's a similar, similar uh, uh, concern about um, having to have legal authority for the action one takes. So this hit me as a, as a federalism case, uh, and I can't comment because I'm not as educated as you are on the background, and that is fascinating too. One striking thing was that there were four dissents, right? So it just wasn't so clear. And uh, in terms of comity, Comity within the court, I think, would have called for the few months delay, and maybe from the point of view of you know Leal's lawyers and dissenters, it was a fool's errand. We know Congress has an awful lot of trouble doing anything, and and, and you know the notion that they would have or will yet uh, you know pass the enabling legislation maybe is not correct, but but given the fact that. 
the court was not in session when this came up. The court is not in session yet. The court comes into session on the first Monday of October. They could have waited that long, you know. Uh, uh, taking everything you said about the background and crediting everything you said about it, um, I see it as a, a separation of powers uh, within the framework of what is the respect that the court owes to the other branches and, and at least representatives of other branches, the Department of State and the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee said, stay your hand for a brief time. And that didn't occur, and I think that was unfortunate. I'm gonna uh, take the moderator's prerogative just to say, I'm gonna uh, take a little bit of Dean Mastrao's time. Uh, I think we have a couple more minutes. I just wanna make a couple, say a couple of things. Um, I, I think that for me, the, the, what explains it, and, and, and uh, General Cruz, if he'll permit me to use that honorific, uh, is right, this, this should have been a, a no-brainer for the court, at least on a formal legal level, because this was the same drama that was en enacted in the Medellin case, precisely the same. And, uh, and they, they went through all this rigmarole one time, why, why do it again? Why did four justices dissent? And for me, this, what, what, what must be going on is there are all sorts of informal dynamics behind the scenes that can't be couched in formal legal terms, uh, but that, that beg the question, of what is the role of a court in an American democracy? Um, how do, can, can a court act as other uh, governmental actors act? That is, informally take into account extra legal considerations and the like. Or must a court simply be a judgment machine? Um, there were a number of circumstances at play here. One is, is that uh, Leal's conviction and his post-conviction proceedings uh, happened in the mid-1990s in Texas at a time when, with all due respect to the state of Texas, the, the Texas process for both capital prosecutions and post-conviction relief was hopelessly broken. You had a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals that was completely, that, that I don't know if it, the problems have been, been addressed, but, but that was beyond belief broken. You had the system of capital representation that the court for a four year time period uh, supervised until that power was taken from it that was broken. Uh, and you, had, you just had a, a, a host of abuses. That's one thing in the background. Another thing in the background is that you have a, had a governor who would have been responsible for implementing this decision, the ICJ's decision, and there's no way that he was gonna do so, as no, neither did his predecessor, uh, President Bush, when he was governor of Texas. This, this would be politically quite un, unpalatable, I would think. Um, but you still had efforts by a, a State Department officials to try to, there were, there were State Department officials went to the state of Texas and said, please, can you please try to do something? Help us out here. There are some serious foreign policy consequences at stake here. Could you just use the discretion you have, what's well within the law, the state, uh, death penalty law in Texas, to at least address some of these problems? There wasn't a response at a time when it was, would have been politically perilous for the governor of Texas to have, to have, uh, 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 to have, have been more flexible in how he handled the situation. And so that comes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, the Obama administration did not do what President Bush did, which is, I am ordering state courts to abide by this judgment. To the contrary, the Obama administration said, please, exercise your equitable discretion to help us out a little bit. Now, would the Congress have actually passed the law? Probably not. It would have bought all the parties a little bit more time to try to work out some kind of solution in a more informal way. That's how I read it. What's remarkable about this is that typically to get a stay of execution, it takes four justices to say, we think there's a reasonable possibility that there might be some grounds for ultimately granting habeas relief. Uh, there were four justices here, and yet the court, as a 5-4 decision, rejected the stay. So it's just a very puzzling, uh, puzzling case, and I think it's puzzling because there are a lot of extra legal uh, considerations at issue here, a lot of pieces in play that we can't see expressed in the formal terms of a legal opinion. But I'll stop there. And with that, I'm not gonna let anybody else respond. I'm just gonna move on to the next set of cases. case, let me tell you, I am excusing myself, and the reason is that the federal uh, judicial ethics prohibit a judge from publicly commenting on any pending litigation in any court. So I commend you all for selecting these cases. I think there will be a wonderful discussion, and I will listen attentively. You should listen particularly attentively to me, Judge Wayne. 
I have read all 300 some pages of the fourth, uh, sixth, and eleventh circuits healthcare decisions, decisions on the constitutionality of the Patient Protection and Affordable Health Care Act, sometimes derisively referred to as Obamacare. Our next set of cases uh, to discuss are remarkable for many, many reasons. Um, one point is worth, worth, worth mentioning. We've had this event uh, now for several years, and we've never discussed anything but Supreme Court decisions. So the mere fact that we've decided to discuss uh, lower court decisions suggests their significance. Um, given the epic-making significance of these cases, what are these cases about the constitutionality of this, this, this act? What are they all about? Um, let me suggest that they're all about this. You say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, there's so much going on in these cases that as I've been preparing for this, I felt the parts of my brain previously reverse, re reserved for the Boston Red Sox and chocolate chip cookies be colonized by Obamacare, which in my mind is the, uh, the, the um, essence of a constitu unconstitutional taking. Um, I I'm not going to have time to do more than summarize the background to the act, uh, the, uh, to give a quick and dirty introduction to the legal issues, and briefly mention along the way how the lower courts have, have decided. And uh, you'll have to forgive me, I'm going to take 15 minutes instead of my allotted 10. On March 23, 2010, President Obama signed into law the, the Affordable Care Act. The problem the statute was designed to remedy is well known. Presently, about 50 million Americans lack health insurance. Over 50% of these, over 60% of these, uh, seek nonetheless consume health care every year. In 2008, these uninsured consumed $100 billion worth of health care of which they only paid for $43 billion. By law, health care providers have to provide some modicum of care to the uninsured, even if the uninsured can't pay for it. Accordingly, uh, the insurance companies and uh, these health care, sorry, these health care providers pass the costs of treating these uninsured along to those of us who do have health insurance in the form of higher premiums or higher co-pays. Of what an average family spends on health insurance each year, $1,000 goes to subsidize those who lack health insurance. The act deals with this problem. Uh, instead of, instead of cre by creating a government-run health care system, the act um, uh, tries to expand the various sources of coverage that presently exist so that pretty much everybody in the country has some kind of coverage or another. It's almost like a Goldberg, a Rube Goldberg type contraption, the way that the act purports to reach universal coverage. For example, the statute provides for a significant expansion to Medicaid. 20% of the presently uninsured will get uh, coverage this way. It prohibits health insurance companies from denying coverage for so-called pre-existing conditions. It greatly limits how health insur insurance companies can terminate coverage and so forth. It requires insurers to let children sh stay on their parents' plans until the age of 26. And then most significantly as far as we're concerned, the act requires every person to have some form of health insurance. This is the famed individual mandate. Okay, I want to say at this juncture that there are a number of alleged constitutional infirmities with the statute. I'm going to focus almost entirely on the individual mandate today. But the panelists might want to talk about um, the question of whether the Medicaid expansion uh, commandeers state governments and the like. There's some other very interesting legal issues, but for our purposes, I'm going to focus on the individual mandate. So let me summarize how this works crudely. If you're not covered by Medicare or Medicaid, if you're not undocumented or incarcerated, or if you don't have a religious objection, then you must, have to, must buy health insurance. If you do not buy health insurance, then you have to pay a penalty. This penalty starts at $95 in 2014, and then rises to either $695 or some percentage of your income by 2016. The idea is to force you to pay roughly the cost of premiums for a basic level health care plan. This, this penalty is collected at tax time. You indicate on your tax return whether you have health insurance. If you don't, your, pre, your, uh, your uh, refund is deducted or your uh, tax liability is increased. Now, the other details I'm not going to go into, but suffice it to say there are many. The statute is 900 pages long. Now, why does the statute include an individual mandate? The insurance, insurance works by risk spreading. I pay premiums each month, but I don't get sick, so I don't consume any health care. All that money that I pay in that the, health, the, the insurance company is not spending on me makes it possible for the insurance company then to pay the huge medical bills of those who do get sick. Insurance companies need a large pool of healthy people paying for health care in order to pay the costs of those who are, who are ill. If there is no individual mandate, then there's what we call the adverse selection problem. A rational person would not bother buying health insurance while healthy. Why pay for something that you don't need? Rather, the person will wait until he or she gets sick and then buy health insurance. 
The insurance customer, insurer's customer base would include only sick people, which is no way for an, to run an insurance business. Up to now, insurance companies dealt with this adverse selection problem simply by refusing to sell insurance to sick people based on pre-existing conditions. But the statute prohibits companies from re refusing to sell based on pre-existing conditions. If a healthy person is not forced to maintain coverage, then the, the rational person could wait until he or she gets sick under the Act and the pro prohibition on pre-existing conditions, uh, uh, then insist on buying affordable health insurance from the company when he or she does get sick. Why waste money now to buy, pay for health insurance when you can just buy affordable health insurance when you're at the hospital door? Insurance companies, of course, would quickly go out of business this way. The individual mandate ensures that healthy people as well as sick people are buying insurance, thereby enabling insurance companies to spread the risk and remain economically viable, um, but not have to deny coverage to those with pre-existing conditions. So what's the problem here? Well, I'll let Senator Orrin Hatch's words summarize it. Congress has never crossed the line between regulating what people choose to do and ordering them to do it. The difference between regulating and requiring is liberty. That was Orrin Hatch 2009. Orrin Hatch in 1993 actually introduced a bill to require people to buy health insurance, but that was in the 90s when we, our notions of liberty were a lot less, uh, less, less set. So what forms of constitutional argument does this fear of foregone liberty take, this, 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 this anxiety about the individual mandate? It's important to stress that, that few seriously argue as a legal matter that individuals have a fundamental right not to buy health insurance. Certain rights are protected as a matter of substantive due process from government interference unless the government has a compelling interest to interfere with them, and the interference is narrowly tailored to address that interest, then these fundamental rights mean that people have to be left alone. Uh, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, for example, couch the right to some modicum of access to abortion in terms of a fundamental right to privacy. The problems with couching a challenge to the individual mandate in terms of substantive due process is that it's guaranteed to fail. Uh, uh, courts are quite reluctant to expand the, uh, the numbers of rights that are considered fundamental uh, as a matter of substantive due process. And the right as couched here would quite uh, quickly rekindle anxieties about reinvigorating the Lochner versus New York notion of fundamental economic liberties. So where opponents have gained more traction is by challenging the individual mandate under the Commerce Clause as a violation of the Commerce Clause limitations on Congress's power. Since the 1930s, the Supreme Court has afforded Congress substantial power to regulate economic activity under the Commerce Clause. At the outer limit of this authority, Congress can regulate wholly intrastate activity if that activity in the aggregate has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Wickard versus Filburn, which many of you probably remember from law school or will, will, if you haven't read it yet, you will next semester. Wickard versus Filburn provides the famous example. Congress can penalize a farmer who grows wheat for his own consumption even if that wheat is never sold, even if the farmer never enters the market for wheat at all, because by eating his own wheat, uh, he and others like him are, do not buy wheat and thereby lower aggregate demand for wheat on the market, depressing prices and affecting interstate commerce. So that's the, one, the outer limit. Beyond those outer limits, Congress cannot regulate non-economic activity like domestic violence or uh, handgun possession near schools um, if that non-economic activity only bears some tangential relationship to interstate commerce. Supporters of the individual mandate uh, say, well, the individual man mandate comes readily within Congress's, Congress's Commerce Clause powers. The decision about whether to buy health insurance is an obviously economic decision. Uh, it has obvious effects on interstate demand for health insurance. Opponents of the individual mandate make a, a number of complicated arguments, but one that recurs frequently is this, that an individual's decision not to buy health care is not commerce. Commerce requires activity, not inactivity. If someone is inactive, is not a participant in any kind of commercial exchange, by choosing not to buy health care, then that person's not engaged in commerce at all. The Eleventh Circuit uh, struck down the individual mandate as unconstitutional in a two-to-one decision. And although it, 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 it insisted that it was not adopting some bright-line distinction between activity and inactivity as far as Congress's Commerce Clause powers are concerned, the Eleventh Circuit majority essentially with, went with this sort of argument. It essentially said that by sitting on the sidelines, a person's not engaged in commerce and can't be regulated as such. Supporters of the individual mandate uh, say, look, with very rare exceptions, everyone is in the health insurance market, whether that person buys a policy or not. The decision not to buy health insurance from a company doesn't mean that you're not active in the health insurance market. It simply means that you're self-insured. Unless you are 100% committed to foregoing health care upon an illness, you're self-insured. This is what the Sixth Circuit, which upheld the, the uh, individual mandate in a two-to-one decision, essentially said. 
Uh, the Fourth Circuit has also addressed this. The Fourth Circuit, uh, the three judges on the three-judge panel uh, upheld uh, uh, the, the statute as a whole on a variety of complicated reasons, but one judge within that three-judge uh, panel uh, went along with this argument as well. The idea here is it's the same as Workard versus Filburn. The farmer was penalized there for not buying wheat on the open market. That person didn't make the decision not to eat. Rather, he made a decision to provide for himself. That decision affects interstate commerce and thus can be regulated. You call it tomato, I call it tomato. You call it inactivity, I call it self-insurance. Supporters have another argument rooted in the necessary and proper clause. Congress assuredly has the power to regulate health in the health insurance market under the Commerce Clause. The necessary and proper clause permits Congress to use any means, even if means them, the means themselves are not independently permitted by the Commerce Clause, to discharge the lawful power if the means are rationally related to the, lawfully, uh, uh, to the uh, lawful exercise of power. Supporters of the individual mandate say that Congress has lawfully regulated health insurance companies, including by prohibiting exclusions on pre-existing conditions. The individual mandate is necessary to this regulation. Without the individual mandate, restrictions on health insurance companies would drive them out of business. Hence, the individual mandate is constitutional under the necessary and proper cause, clause. The Sixth Circuit went along with a variant of this argument. Opponents say the individual mandate is not necessary for the regulation of health insurance companies in the manner that the statute does. The Eleventh Circuit majority said, at best, the individual mandate counteracts the significant regulatory costs of the uh, statute when it, when it comes to health insurance companies. But this is a political consideration. Whether insurance companies go under based on how they're regulated is not a constitutional consideration. You call it tomato, I call it tomato. You call the individual mandate a political consideration, I call it a consideration essential to the success of a lawful regulatory scheme. Finally, supporters of the individual mandate say this is just a tax. And Congress has ample power under the Taxing and Spending Clause to tax people $695 if they don't buy health insurance. After all, the statute doesn't put people in jail for not buying health insurance. If you don't want health insurance, you just pay slightly higher taxes. The opponents say this is not a tax, it's a penalty. Congress described the individual mandate as a penalty, and we take Congress's word. Uh, take, take, we go, go, go with Congress's word. If Congress says it's a penalty, it's a penalty, and we're not going to therefore consider it a tax for the purposes of Congress's taxing and spending power. Supporters say, don't make a fortress out of these mere words. The effect of the individual mandate is exactly the same as if Congress simply passed a law uh, taxing uninsured people $695. The Eleventh Circuit said, we're going to go with what Congress said. Congress called it a penalty. Therefore, it's a penalty, not a tax. The Fourth Circuit didn't address this issue directly. It addressed it in a very interesting uh, a separate context that I don't have time to go into. But essentially, what the majority of the Fourth Circuit said is that, in effect, the individual mandate operates as a tax, and so we'll consider it a tax. You call it tomato, I call it tomato. You call the mandate a penalty, I call it a tax. So then we're left with this difficult problem. How do we decide as a matter of constitutional law whether something is a tomato or a tomato? I consider the decision not to buy health insurance a decision to self-insure, and thus quite an active one with serious ramifications for interstate commerce. You consider the decision, one, to abstain from commerce entirely and thus opt for inactivity. Does the Constitution give us a neutral, apolitical way to say who is right? Or is the answer going to depend on the ideologies of nine of our fellow citizens? My answer is that the Constitution doesn't quite tell us whether we should say tomato or tomato, but it gives us a useful pronunciation guide for hard cases. We know that Congress's efforts to legislate pursuant to the Commerce Clause are subject to the quite deferential rational basis review. We know that legislation warrants a heavy presumption of constitutionality and that the court should pause before it decides to strike something down as unconstitutional. We also know that facial challenges to a statute's constitutionality are disfavored. These guides tell us how best to pronounce the words. Every presumption at issue in this case counsels for deference to the political branches. These cases turn on how you look at facts in the world. That's, what, that's my belief. There's no obvious legal doctrine that tells us how to look at these facts. In this instance, then, it would be a remarkable exercise of judicial activism for the Supreme Court to strike down the Health Care Act. ACA, the Affordable Care Act, because now Dave can't think about chocolate chip cookies. And if you're not thinking about them, you're not going to eat them, right? So I think that that's, and I'm hoping that having read these cases and having to continue to read them because I teach con law, that I'll stop thinking about potato chips and the Green Bay Packers. And if you're from Wisconsin, that is the same part of your brain. I want you to know. <laughs>
indeed, if we were to sell this mechanism, you have to really use the cases rather than just talk about them, and you actually have to try to understand the ACA, um, I think that we would uh, have everybody uh, a lot thinner. So let's go. Right. This, his, his thesis is it's a remarkable exercise of judicial activism to overturn this, and I have a dozen reasons why I think the United States Supreme Court should worry about just that. First, he's right. This is heavily fact-dependent. Just understanding what this act is is uh, almost an act of heroism. Um, and it's very complex, and it's not just the cases that we've looked at. There's something like, there have been at one point, 27 uh, cases sprinkled all over the country. Uh, this isn't enough by itself that something's complex, but the density of this um, and uh, uh, the, the extent to which it hinges on pretty sophisticated notions of how to solve this problem, I think would give me pause if I was one of the nine. Second, there's no doubt this is a matter of national concern. This is not something that just you know Wyoming should care about. And so uh, it seems to me that this is, it would be folly to call this something that's purely a matter of local concern in the way that some strong federalism arguments um, in other contexts um, might and would make a lot more sense to me. We have 43 um, billion dollars um, that's being consumed by the uninsured. And while that uh, is less than 2% of our health care um, expenditures, as the Congress points out in the legislation, we're talking about 17.6% of the national economy. It, it blows the mind. And as a, a former manager, I can tell you worrying about this sort of problem and how we're <coughs> going to deal with the escalating costs and how we're going to figure out how to get this done in the future. Um, anyone who brings that reality is making a big mistake. And I don't think anybody is. Um, Almost 50 million uninsured. Okay, so we've got a serious problem, it's a national problem, and it's not a local problem, and it's a fact-dependent uh, problem. Third, Congress has spoken. Um, uh, we were talking uh, just a little bit before about the importance of the congressional elected branch in the separation of powers and being anxious about uh, presidential sort of unitary executive imperialism. Um, the Congress did deliberate, and the Congress did come up with a a solution, rightly or wrong, this, and if you look at the actual legislation, this is not an example of, let's throw it out the wall and see what sticks. There are some instances, local instances, in which some legislators in, at, at a non-congressional level have actually said things like this. We'll throw it at the wall, we'll leave it up to the courts, and we'll see what sticks. Um, uh, unfortunately, I mean, if you want to be a sovereign, you need to, uh, quoting uh, an article Dave and I were talking about, act like one. Uh, in a responsible fashion, I think that the Congress in this case made an attempt in the legislature itself, as did uh, the, the uh, at, right after 9-11 um, in the Homeland Security Initiative at that time, the Patriot Act, where there was a, a good faith effort to speed um, um, was part of that legislation to observe uh, the limits of Komatsu, of not wanting to go there. In this case, though, you'll see that they have paid attention to the constitutional grammar. Um, the court up till this point had said, you're going to have to do your homework. You're going to establish your rational basis. You're going to have to document why you think you have a reasonable belief that in the aggregate, the, the uh, behavior in question might have an impact on interstate commerce. Uh, you may disagree with the facts of how they resolved it, but the Congress plainly did do um, that, and it's reflected in the legislation itself. Fourth, and this is where I think uh, the greatest disagreement is tomato, tomato. Um, I think that they would have to distort or significantly modify existing doctrine in order to strike down the individual mandate. Or they're going to have to do, and this is what's been so much of a difficult struggle for the courts below. They're going to have to add a criterion. They're going to have to add something that they think is in the future going to be judicially manageable in order to say why this is beyond the pale and say the partial birth abortion act, uh, based on the Commerce Clause authority was not um, uh, beyond congressional power. I'm not buying in a lot of these instances actually the structural arguments that are being made by people. I think a lot does depend on whether you like the legislation or you don't like the legislation. But I think there's a reason beyond the ideological inflection uh, perceived uh, to exist among American academics and constitutional law theorists by most people thought this was an easy case 
And in fact, those who are arguing it's not an easy case, that the case law does admit the argument that this goes too far, often I say, but if I'm betting it on, and I'm looking at this case law, it's pretty much a slam dunk unless they're going to change the law, unless they're going to go in a different direction. In other words, Congress was paying attention to doctrine. And most people looking at it, or who are doomed to look at it for the rest of their lives, um, uh, thus the potato chips, um, that would be me, would say, you know, it does fit. Yeah, it's wicker, but wicker's not a new case. It's an old case. And if the First Amendment is something that allows for cultural generation, over time, I would hope that the Commerce Clause would also allow for cultural generation and adaptation <laughs> in response to uh, changing problems. So unless they're going to come up with a new, essentially formalist way of distinguishing activity versus inactivity, tomato, tomato, the market is the market for insurance, not the market for health care, you know, any number of these moves. But it's not, um, I mean, the judges are the one who are going to have to do it. And the judges already are saying, they, don't, they themselves, even those who have argued that this thing should be struck down, are moving away from. I'm not deciding this on the basis of activity, inactivity, or omission, commission. They see it. They see that that's ultimately not actually very persuasive. And so it, is, it boils down to a lament. If Congress can do this, it can do anything. They can make us buy broccoli and eat it. <laughs> and in fact, this is a completely, this argument is so old it has whiskers. It's like we think we've just discovered it anew um, in our innocent way. But this has been a part of the problem of thinking about the parameters of the Commerce Clause from the beginning when they've really focused on it. This is an important observation. Though it's enumerated, it's got limits. Um, but you, if history is a guide to anything, it doesn't give you the answers, but it tells you the questions to ask. And um, if you ask the question, do I have a better way of handling this than the representative branch, um, you might be humbled by looking at attempts and what happened to them before, rather than just um, attaching some epithet to the legislation itself, which is popular, or resurrecting FDR just to kill him again. Um, and you know, which I think is, is also happening here. In response to if Congress can do this, it can do anything, it's easy enough to come back with the counter lament. If the court can tell Congress it can't do this based on some arid formalism or some line that's going to be almost impossible to manage the day after, then it can do anything. And there goes your partial birth abortion act and some other things might, might. In any event, I don't see that anybody's yet come up with a new criterion that's persuasive enough, that's persuasive enough. And it's not true that Congress can do anything. Now, they struck down VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and in that case, too, I think Congress really did a valiantly attempt to document the economic <coughs> impact of uh, uh, domestic violence in that case. Um, I think that there, as, as Dave has pointed out again, that there is a grammar and that our Congress, like it or not, um, uh, and just wait a minute, um, it's, it's, it's almost certain to change, um, did the best it could with the grammar it had and asked the right questions in order. But fundamentally, it's supposed to be a rational basis, not like this, do whatever you want. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate for it, but as my understanding of the case law as it is, that's, the, that's, that's what it is now. And that, that has, that, according to that standard, they should, this should survive that scrutiny. Let me say something else. This is a provision that several courts, the Congress, and even Randy Barnett, the professor at Georgetown, has been most, I think, uh, creative and articulate and pushing why this is unconstitutional. He says, of course, this is necessary. <laughs> like, if I'm one of the nine, this would, again, give me a lot. Of course, it's necessary, but it's not proper. OK. Um, but you, you, again, the just, justices would be second guessing a determination with respect to how essential this is to at least parts of the rest of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Sixth, it's a requirement, this liberty plan, this bears repeating, this demand that you get insurance, the states can require the security. Now you might, want, you might think it shouldn't, um, but it is a requirement the states themselves can and some have imposed on their own citizens. So the liberty dog won't hunt. 
or not far. It's an old, it's an old dog. It's, it is the, the Lochner dog, and we've almost killed it, that little thing. Um, it's also something else. This is an issue that affects everybody in this room, whether you, whether you realize it or not. And I think that American people are absolutely engaged. This isn't like a gun controversy abortion. Um, or, and it's not like a host of other congressional legislation where even the politically active people are mostly asleep at the wheel. No, they're not paying attention. This is a case in which uh, bumper stickers, uh, uh, campaigns, uh, people running for office, I don't know. I'll have to look and see what you do with it. Um, but my guess is it's going to be used. And it's being used in a way that people are attending to. Should the unelected branch of government, does, do we need them here? Do we really need them to decide this versus some other issues where historically you thought, yeah, I don't care if it's radical. I want the court to step in. I don't care if it's counter-majoritarian. I do care about liberty. OK, well, articulate your reasons for thinking this is such a case. In those cases, in those cases, the usually bias or capture them. It's not something that affects everybody. Or there's some political process breakdown. This is not that case, not by a wide <clears throat> margin. Finally, you know, there's, there's, there, this would call the question on a politically charged issues. Every single news report with respect to, and again, imagine you're the judge, every single news report tells you who appointed that judge. Every single, you know, this isn't good for the judiciary, or maybe it just is, we're all legal realists now. Some of them get even snarkier and they want to say, and where did he, where did he or she go to law school? I like the opinion. It must have been Arizona. <laughs> Opinion's bad, gotta be. Arizona, right? Um, I mean, that's not that's not healthy. Um, that's not healthy for the judiciary. It's also on the heels of Bush against Gore, which Linda's famous to describe as the court staff I love that. But it's also on the heels of Citizens uh, United. It's on the heels of Iowa judges losing their jobs because people didn't like the results in the case up there. It's on the heels of the Kagan confirmation hearing. If you're watching, and I watched every bit of it, every fifth word was judicial activism. Judicial activism. Judicial activism. This is another one of these tropes that's incredibly popular right now. But you couldn't tell whether it was a Democrat or Republican until how the sentence ended. If the sentence ended with Citizens United, it was a Democrat. So the judicial activism. Weirdly, if the sentence ended with Thurgood Marshall, um, it was it, seriously watch it and see if I'm, I'm engaged in hyperbole. No, but they were all worried about judicial activism. The way that if I'm a judge, I would start to worry about separation of powers and preservation of my authority um, and uh, overturning the representative branch of government. Um, and I think that this is an issue. It's on the eve of an election. Everybody knows it. It's a wedge issue. It's being used. It's called Obamacare, not congressional care. Um, or um, you know, Bush didn't solve it care, um, or whatever care you want to want. It's being called Obamacare for a reason. And, um, and, it's, and there's a frightful lunacy. Let me read to you what a lawyer did. This is not a lawyer threat. In the case that just was decided this week, in the complaint, now, this is ideologically inflected. I think this is terrible, and, and any students here, I'll be embarrassed for you and for me if you write a complaint. In, which, in this case, and people in good faith can disagree, Unless citizens are now to be considered mere economic slaves of congressional will, wise, the aggregate effect of people sitting in their own basement or their own homes or anywhere else in the territory of the United States moves beyond the Congress will. It'll force Americans out of the comfort of their homes into pre-selected economic markets. Ah, it's going to do it whether they need it or not. That's not so bad. It'll send the Constitution off a plateau of limited government and over the cliff into the abyss of a permanent state of socialism. <laughs> Here too for rejected by every American generation and a manifest constitutional evil which must be reversed by this capitalist out of the court. Until they don't do what you want, then it's designed to court. In signing this into law, President Obama, with Congress serving as his willing partisan accomplice, the con committed nothing less than a virtual lynching of the Constitution terminated once and for all any pretext of a federal government possessed of limited, you get the idea. Hearty congratulations from the hemisphere's most notorious despot, who the people who fund my campaign. Um, Fidel Castro is what is actually in here. But you, you get the idea, and you know, I, it, this is lunacy to me. This but part don't of touch my Medicare. Yeah, well, that's another part, you know, so you have to worry about this. If you are a statesperson, judge who cares 
about the common good and the whole. Now, I don't know, after he won, this lawyer won, he said that this was prevented the dark passages of the book of Revelations, and most important case since Rogan's wave, stop the beast of commerce. Okay. And finally, in this case, this is a case in which the best advocates admit their own offline. What they want is radical reform, not tinkering. They're aiming at the old cases, and they're aiming at John Marshall himself. And this is what's really underlying. This is an important conversation for us to be having as American people. Um, that part, I mean, what was going on at the founding, whether or not we should look at what was happening again in 1868 and so on. Um, uh, but is this the place to resolve that? And is Dave right that this is going to be a massive constitutional confrontation that the court is going to conduct now, this next term? I don't, what's my answer? I don't think it has to. You say tomato, I say tomato, I say let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> I, think, I think that we need to restore a sense of the value of passive virtues. And I would say that not as an apologist for uh, procedural answers to substantive questions, uh, but this isn't Bush against Gore. It isn't. We don't need to know who our next president is today. Um, this is something where time could, I've learned some from every single opinion that's come down. These are very complicated cases, and I hope that the court waits. I hope that the court waits as long as it can. It's with back to what Judge Wake was saying about exercising its discretion. Uh, it may not be able to. Uh, when it does decide it, I think, and this is known as the part, easy for you to say you're a professor. I hope they don't reintroduce Eric Formlessons. I hope they don't invent a new liberty that they somehow locate in the Tenth Amendment in this anti common doing thing that I don't have time to go into and explain why I, I, I think it's, it's, it's analytically coherent. Um, I hope they don't do something else. There's a lot of talk about this is new, never seen before. Um, the book the black, about black swans, you know, these events now, there, there are these things that are low frequency uh, probabilities, um, but somebody paying attention can predict um, with, with a, a great deal of of the sense that they're depressed enough, you know, that they can just keep looking at bad things, but that there suddenly things can happen that are fairly catastrophic, that can't be foreseen. It's one thing to say we want to put a traditional break on due process rights or exceptions uh, to the First Amendment. It's another thing to make novelty a reason why the United States Congress can't respond to that. I think that the framers would, would think that that was money too. Um, uh, it's just the wrong place to be, the novelty of it corresponds to something that's happening in the real world that has to do with the facts. Now, whether or not uh, uh, the right answer to this is to have the individual man mandate, I suspect very few of us in the room actually know enough about to weigh in on it. That's my, I, mean, I, I would have claimed to. I would want my, I think I'm going to have to have talk to our colleagues and we'd have to get a much longer conversation. Um, so what would I do if I were the court and they decide to take it anyway? What's going to happen? It's going to be up to Kennedy or Leo and Roberts. It is. Now among them, what are they likely to do? I can't tell. I can't tell. They're not afraid, um, any of them, uh, to write things that seem to reach out, but they're also, I think, in other times they curb their enthusiasm. And they do it in ways that I think can be occasionally a model of the court preserving its own uh, powder. If they strike it down, they're not going to, I think, like, overrule the color, or even with it at Fort Hill Farm. I think that they're going to find, struggle very hard to find a modest way to do it, even if they're immodest in the inside. If they uphold it, I think they're going to try and do it on more technical grounds. If it's possible, and that may make this most recent appellate case uh, the most attractive one, um, but it requires holding that this is a tax, and that's a problem. Thomas and Scalia, no doubt, uh, Scalia will find a way to be delightful and brutal, and, um, and he won't restrain himself. <coughs> and Thomas, you know what he's going to do. Let's say 18th century. And he's been clear, he stated his position, and he, in, in, it's analytically, uh, 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 he, there's a lot of integrity to it, but no one else is going to turn it. Um, so it's going to be about what these others do, and what's going to happen the day after? What's going to happen the day after? It's still going to be a hot button wedge issue. Believe you me, what's going to happen is, instead of driving uh, behind the car that says, County Care makes me sick, it's going to be, County Care even made the law train delete sick, um, if, if it turns out that it's struck down. It'll be used 
in the election no matter what the court does. Um, or, you know, I, 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 I predict, I mean, I could think of how the left could use it, how the right could use it. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that whatever the court does, they think about the future of the court um, as, as well as, as the doctrine um, uh, that they will be mucking with and that the, the investigation into the history part of it includes um, uh, an important quality, which is humility. There's a reason um, that the question can't be adequately answered. If Congress can do this, we can do anything because it's an ever-changing uh, river that we're stepping into. It. I think it doesn't, it won't mean that no matter which way the court goes. It took me like three weeks to come up with that tomato tomato thing, and then uh, the dean uh, was able to use it even more adeptly just on the fly. So I continue to be in, in awe of my, my co panelists. Um, I'll turn it over to Linda Greenhouse. That was a fabulous presentation, Tony, really. Um, so, in terms of what the court's likely to do, I think one of the most telling <coughs> boasts of the past couple of terms was Chief Justice Roberts' silent uh, joining the Breyer opinion in the Comstock case from a term ago. So Comstock uh, was a case that came up under the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution. Uh, the case called into question the validity of a federal statute that remits into federal custody mentally ill sex offenders who have served their criminal sentence. And it allowed the statute calls for the feds to keep them in <coughs> extended uh, civil confinement. Uh, and, you know, the federal government has very limited uh, criminal jurisdiction. You know, 98% of all criminal matters in the country are matters of, of state uh, policy and enforcement. So this was a very unusual statute. Uh, and it had been struck down by the lower court in the Supreme Court in a prior opinion uh, reversed uh, with the acquiescence of Chief Justice Roberts, who didn't feel called upon to say anything, and said this was a, under the Necessary and Proper Clause, this was uh, an adequate, uh, it was adequately constitutionally grounded in the government's ability to basically um, carry out its mandate uh, to keep the country, to keep the populace safe. Uh, so I think that's quite important, and, and the Chief Justice is a student of history. And I think for all the reasons that you said, I think it would be um, remarkable uh, for the court to strike this down. Uh, it is a very fact-bound question in the sense that the longer we have a conversation about the statute, the more people, the more the public, I think, will realize that. For instance, the, uh, uh, the ban on uh, refusing to write insurance because of pre-existing conditions you know, that, uh, that David mentioned, uh, you know, when you hear that first, you think, oh, a pre-existing condition, some horrible chronic illness. You know, of course, that would be extremely expensive for an insurance company to, to insure. Well, you know, a anybody who's tried to buy private insurance in the last five years realizes that pre-existing condition mean, can mean, you know, your back ever went out, you had a sinus infection, um, you know, I mean, the most benign uh, conditions that come up in your medical history will disable you from buying insurance in the private market. And, and the more people realize, uh, the, <coughs> and it's incumbent on people who support this legislation, I think, to make sure that, you know, people do understand exactly what this means. I mean, uh, if you've ever had a child graduate from college uh, without a job and had gotten kicked off of your employer provided health insurance and suddenly didn't have any and you tried to buy insurance in the private market and, you know, your kid ever had, basically ever got sick uh, and, and so on. I won't, you know, I won't belabor the point, but um, basically, and I've read all these opinions too, uh, the 11th Circuit opinion that struck the law down, the Judge Dubina opinion, I found um, vapid because I, I, I meant to count, but I got too tired. The number of times he said, this is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. There's never been anything like this. Well, it wouldn't be so unprecedented if, the, if President Nixon's health care plan or the 
uh, you know, any number of Republican legislators over the last generation that supported a plan like this until it, it became their policy to make sure that nothing that President Obama ever, uh, you know, got passed uh, would redound to his credit, you know, wouldn't be so unprecedented. It would be uh, the law of the land as it is in every uh, civilized country that provides this kind of safety net for its populace. So, uh, you know, when, when I read the uh, opinion upholding the statute by Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the Sixth Circuit, uh, a Republican appointed, quite conservative judge who's a great hero of the Federalist Society and so on, um, and a friend of mine. And I thought, you know, you go, Jeff, because you're the first member of your party who's been willing to say what I think is obviously true, that uh, of, of the attack on the statute, which is that this emperor has no clothes. Well, I, I don't think anyone is surprised uh, that the remainder of this panel uh, fervently hopes that the health care bill is not struck down. Uh, and, and I don't think anyone will be shocked to discover that I very much hope that it is. Uh, there is no doubt that if one took a referendum of law professors across this country on the question of should the health care bill be struck down, 90 percent would vote now, if not more. Uh, there is no doubt if one took a referendum of the news media, should the health care law be struck down, 95 percent would vote now, if not more. But neither of those pools will be making the decision in this case. Uh, in this case, it will be nine justices on the Supreme Court that will be deciding it, I think, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, and I think the decision is likely to be quite different from what we have heard earlier this afternoon. I would note those same pools, the law school faculty and news media, if they were to cast votes on the outcome in the Medellin case or the Citizens United case or any of a host of other cases, would likewise have disagreed with those cases really quite emphatically. In this case, I, I think this is a case that really goes down to foundational questions uh, about our federal government. Uh, when our Constitution was formed, uh, the most revolutionary aspect of what the framers did in drafting the Constitution was to invert the notion of government. For millennia, the view had been that power emanated from the top, that kings and monarchs endowed by God with authority over their subjects, ruled people. And any rights were given by grace from the monarch. To my mind, the most extraordinary thing the framers did in the Constitution is they inverted that. And they began with the notion that, that sovereignty begins with the people. And that power is given from the people to the government, but only to, limited, to a limited extent. And in particular, in an extraordinary innovation, they, they, they put into our Constitution the notion of enumerated powers. It used to be the government could do anything. And you could perhaps carve out some exceptions that were rights, but if you didn't have an exception, the government could do it. And what the framers said in the Constitution is, no, 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 the default is the opposite. In Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, we, we're going to enumerate specific powers. As Madison described them, few and far between that the federal government shall have. And if it's not given to, to the federal government, they don't have that. And if that wasn't clear enough in Article I, Section 8, they passed the Ninth and Tenth Amendments as bookends to restate that simple proposition. Now, case law has taken us a long way from that. But I think there are two questions that are really incredibly illuminating. The first question, and both of them have been, been referred to somewhat derisively, but, but I think they're really quite revealing questions. The first question is, has any Congress in the history of the United States of America believed it had the power to and attempted to exercise the power 
to regulate inaction? And the answer that the U.S. Department of Justice has given, that every defender of this statute has given, is no. The answer is, it is unprecedented. And, you know, look, I, I have to say as someone who believes that unlimited government power is an inimical threat to human liberty, that any time I see a branch of government claiming an unprecedented, novel assertion of power that in our 230-year history has never before been seen, whether it is the president, a president I worked for, George W. Bush in Medellin, claiming a novel and unprecedented power to order the state courts to do something, or this Congress and this president claiming a novel and unprecedented power to regulate a whole new area. In my judgment, that is reason for great, great concern. The fact that no other Congress has ever believed or has ever acted in an attempt to regulate in this manner communicates a great deal. But the second question is even more illuminating, which is if it is right that we have a government of enumerated powers, a question that has been posed to the U.S. Justice Department over and over again in defense of the health care bill is, okay, if this is constitutional under the Commerce Clause, what isn't? Now, that might be described as an old dead dog with whiskers. But it's a very illuminating question. Because heretofore, the lawyers the U.S. Justice Department has sent into court have been unable to answer that question, have been unable to point to a single sphere of human activity that is outside the ambit of the Commerce Clause. Because any example that's presented immediately runs into trouble with how this is regulated. Now, now what is the threshold that, that was crossed? With respect to this bill, and I'll actually go to some of the language in the complaint that was read. If you go home tonight and lock the door in your bedroom, and you put a pile of food there, and you sit there, and you don't leave your house for a year, you don't speak to anyone, you don't spend money, you do nothing. You simply exist and breathe. This bill applies to you. This bill places an affirmative mandate on you by the simple aspect that you are a human being inhaling and exhaling air. That is why people describe this as a black swan event. Government has never before the federal government has never before regulated people for simply existing. And if they can do that, engaging in no commerce whatsoever, and the theoretical concern, well, you might ultimately at one point get sick and later engage in commerce so we can regulate you to do that. Okay, if that's the argument, what can't be regulated? Number one, Lopez and Morrison are plainly wrong. I mean, under that theory, I mean, the arguments that were presented in Lopez is bringing a gun to school, if you shoot someone, oh, boy, you're going to get a lot of commerce there. You had to buy the gun. You had to buy the ammunition. All of those arguments were presented. And the Supreme Court struck, struck down the statute in Lopez. I mean, if you can do the ultimate knee bone is connected to the leg bone is connected to eventually you get to commerce, if that's an unlimited thing, I will say one thing. Our framers were the worst drafters in history. If you were taking a statutory drafting class or a constitutional drafting class, their work product would get an F. Because if it's right that the Commerce Clause or the Commerce Clause plus the Necessary and Proper Clause enables everything, then why the heck is the rest of Article 1, Section 8 there? Or for that matter, much of Article 1 at all. Why is there a power to create a post office, to coin money? I mean, all of those easily fall in. They were really lousy drafters. If commerce is that broad that everything is wrapped in, they should have just said Congress can do everything. What I will say, that there is no doubt great passion on this issue. But at the end of the day, and I think likely by June of next year, the U.S. Supreme Court's going to resolve it. My prediction, notwithstanding 
uh, the strong views expressed here today. I think it is more likely than not a majority of the court will conclude the individual mandate exceeds the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Now, I also think it is more likely than not a majority of the court will conclude that provision is severable from the remainder of the Health Care Act. And that was a division. If you look at the 11th Circuit, the district court concluded it was not severable. The 11th Circuit concluded it was. And I think there is some real likelihood that is how the court will cut the baby in half. And it would not surprise me at all if Justice Kennedy were with four, four justices on conclusion A and a different four justices on conclusion B. I think that is an entirely possible outcome. Now, some of the people in this room will be very dismayed by that outcome if it happens. Some will be pleased. Uh, but I think that is really quite a likely outcome. And then I think the case will go back to the political process, particularly if we find the remainder of that statute. And, and, I, and, I, and I will say it was interesting, the dean mentioned this wasn't an example of, of a statute being just thrown at the wall to see what's there. I, you know, I am obliged to point out the Speaker of the House said from the podium, we have to pass the bill to see what's in it. Um, that is as damning a statement has been made in legislation in recent history. Um, but that's not why it's going to be struck down. I think it's going to be struck down because the alternative is to change us from a government of enumerated powers to a government of general jurisdiction, and I don't think this Supreme Court's going to be willing to do that. I think we have three minutes left. I'm going to, I'm going to let uh, my better uh, take on take, well, to respond. I wish Abraham Lincoln were, you know, I always think of him in these contexts. We must think of him, we must act of him. 1862. I think that this emphasis on the novelty, it, it's, it's, I think it's craven. I don't think it's the real thing that's going on here. Um, uh, and I, and I, I hope not. And I think that uh, your, your prediction of what the court would do, um, I bet you're right. Um, the predictions I've read range from 8-1, upholding it to 6-3, uh, striking it down to 4, you know, you name it. And you've worked there, so uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but I would be dismayed, not for the reasons that you name. I actually have to say that that, too, is a trope. Those left-leaning law professors, you know, that's, you know, it's, that's, that's what they do. Um, and, and presuming to know um, what, uh, what political apparatus would be going on in me, for example, in thinking about this. I'm telling you, I'm basing it on reading these cases for 30 years. And, um, and I do think that when the people who are against it are honest with the full flowering, is that they're against the case law. And they're against a lot of case law that is going in a direction that they don't like. Um, you know, can we come up with, Randy's done the best job possible in the brief, um, Randy Barnett and some others in trying to say, well, no, Morrison and Lopez mean something. That's the break. You've got that. I agree. Um, but I don't think that, that anything, you've, it's tomato, tomato. I think Dave is right, and we've just proved it here today. He hasn't persuaded me, and I've only ticked him off. <laughs> and in the spirit of Chief Justice Rehnquist, we are all sunshine and light together. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for coming. It's been a really privilege to present these cases before you.